Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible, but I, I can go on and on, so you can. I'm going to go through a little bit of the MS4 um, permit, which is a requirement of our permit, is actually to educate the decision makers, such as yourself. And then um, when I get to the end of that, I'm going to stop for questions, and then I'm going to go into our watershed plans. We've been doing a lot of work in Scarborough um, in some of our impaired watersheds. so. Wanted to touch on that and, and the work that we're doing is associated with that. So, um, first of all, um, also here tonight is uh, Steve Buckley, is uh, the deputy director at Public Works, and the two of us um, probably do the heavy lifting with our MS4 permit. Um, but we're not the only ones. There's many um, staff in multiple departments. Jamel Torres, the assistant planner, is, is behind Mike and Jay Chase, you guys all know. Um, so our two departments probably do a lot of it, but I'll get it to the other pieces where all the departments kind of have a, a role to play in what we do. So it starts with um, the Clean Water Act and basically um, saying that um, anytime you have a discharge um, to any water body, we need to have a, a permit associated with it. So there's some standards, requirements associated with, associated with that which um, is where we fall into um, needing our federal permit. This is the town of Scarborough. And I'm throwing out the term MS4, so I just wanted to kind of talk through that a little bit. Um, it stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, and that's a mouthful, so we say MS4. Um, and it basically means that we have uh, separated our sewer and our storm drain systems. and. Um, as you all probably know, um, they used to be combined. And we used to discharge raw sewage right into all of our water bodies. And um, that's where the Clean Water Act comes into play. <coughs> so we're going to separate that all out. I think Scarborough is actually um, in a good place as far as that goes. There's many like larger communities, cities, um, not to, to call anyone out, but obviously bigger cities like Portland, South Portland, even SACO have combined systems still that they're trying to, you know, that's part of their program is to separate those out where we're already kind of ahead of that, um, where we have a newer sewer system. So um, there's some pieces that um, we don't have to deal with as much as other communities. And so the communities that are affected by this type of permit, there are 30 in the state of Maine and they they go in clusters, and as you can see, it's really the Kittery, Greater Portland, Lewiston, Auburn, and the Greater Bangor area. And those are obviously the urbanized, the more developed areas. And so they fall under the same, we all fall under the same sort of permit um, and have to do and follow the same requirements. Um, we do tailor them specifically to the town of Scarborough, but the overarching requirements are required by all of these 30 communities. And the permit is on a five-year cycle. So we're actually up for renewal in July of this year. Um, so we've been spending the past year really working with DEP and EPA on what, what are we going to add, because every permit means new requirements. And I'm going to get to that at the end and, and kind of talk through a little bit of the differences that are coming to us in July. Um, but. Um, so we've been working trying to make sure we have a good handle on what those are and actually comment back and DEP has been a good partner with that and working back and forth and saying here's why maybe this doesn't work so much for some of the municipalities. Obviously it's a give and take so uh, we don't get everything we want but <laughs> um, it's it's a, at least um, a collaboration and, and kind of that conversation happening and so Stephen and I have actually been part of the, the permit renewal committee and have been um, in depth into those conversations, it's been good. Um, and so then I'm just going to walk through very quickly. I know all of you have been through this before, where that we have six minimum control measures, and just kind of identifying what those six things are that we touch upon. Um, annually, I also have to fill out a survey 
um, that says what the counselors in, in the town of Scarborough know about our MS4 permit. And so um, part of it is just knowing that you guys know that there is a permit, do you know what the elements of the permit are, are, those are the six, and so that's why I do this and kind of walk through. So the first one is um, public education outreach. <clears throat> this is one that we do collaboratively with um, part of our interlocal stormwater working group. And the 14 raindrops that are in an array represent the 14 communities that we work together with, basically ranging from um, Bitterford up to Freeport and from Cape Elizabeth out to Wyndham. We meet uh, pretty much monthly, um, take a couple months off during the year, but pretty regularly once a month and um, work on really the first two elements of our permit, which is the public um, education outreach and also the public participation. But then it goes beyond that because we also, um, with the other pieces, while we don't do them together, we are able to kind of bounce ideas off each other. And what are you doing with this? And how are you dealing with that? And I think that's been a real uh, a model for other organizations to look at how we can collaboratively work um, as a region. And I think, um, uh, actually, Robin Saunders is here from um, Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District, who um, their, their group helps facilitate that, that um, Izzywood group. And um, it's been, I think, very beneficial to the town of Scarborough and, um, and how we do that as a region. Part of it, education and outreach, where um, we have paid for the ducky ads, the commercials on TV. There's a whole program on um, yardscaping, and they come to um, Scarborough Adult Education to do some yardscaping classes. Um, and also, we um, do every other year a stormwater conference um, for the state of Maine, and um, Mike Sean, myself, actually presented at the last one in October of last year um, on Redbrook and all the great things that, that we've done in that watershed and implemented in that watershed. And it was very well received. So um, it's pretty proud of that. The next piece is um, the public and education. And one of the big focal points of that program is uh, an urban runoff 5K. And then at the end of that is um, a Green Neighbors Family Festival. And that's held in Portland at, um, during high school. And it loops around. Actually, I was quite surprised to find out there's actually woods in the middle of Portland. But I did go through. And you're pretty much, yeah, in the middle of the woods. I was quite shocked. And, um, but the, it is, it's a really good um, trail system through there, too. And um, it is a great um, event and has um, a lot, I think we are at 700 last year, 700 um, runners. And then for um, volunteers, we get um, on our annual report that we report back to DEP, we say how many um, Town of Scarborough residents run it, how many um, of the municipal um, employees are in it, and how many volunteer. And I will say that um, Scarborough's got a lot of kudos for the consistency in our volunteers. Um, I know every year Mike Shaw and his wife are doing setup, and um, and then uh, Steve Buckley is always in the water station in the woods, and it's been a safe. It's just one of those things with the organization um, that it, they're just the go-to. This is what you do, and my, me and my family are at the finish line shoot, hanging, handing out water bottles, and that's just where we end up. <laughs> <clears throat> But it's, it actually raises a lot of money that goes back towards um, education. So they go back into, um, I know they have a program in the middle schools. So it goes back into the Scarborough schools and they teach um, in the earth sciences more about the water quality and, um, and, and keeping our water bodies clean, which I think they do a lot of good work. And also just forming um, programs that they can hand off to teachers, science teachers that can kind of continue along that path. So I think the money that is raised is, is used in a very productive and beneficial way and, and it affects us in, the, in Scarborough specifically too. Um, the next step isn't as much fun. <laughs> this is um, illicit discharge detection and elimination, which we say IDDE. Um, 
really, um, this piece is about knowing where all our stormwater system is. We have to map everything. Um, and that's part of what we were looking at um, in the past. Council has helped support and fund our storm drain um, assessment that we're doing. And really, it's critical to know um, where infrastructure is, but also the condition it is, and really the risk of failure. And so what happens um, in the likelihood of failure. And so to know all of that information is, is really part of this permit as well. And so that um, we also have to know what kind of relationship it is to the sewer, because you don't want the cross-contamination, things like that. Um, and a lot of times you think of um, storm drain, you think of just a pipe, um, but it's also our ditches, which Scarborough has a lot of roadside ditches. Mm -hmm. So that's a big task in itself to kind of keep on top of those, and maintaining those, and inspecting <coughs> those, and, and checking for um, really, you can see up there, it's, it's like, if someone puts their washing machine into their sump, mm -hmm. uh, that's what happens. <laughs> and that is an illicit discharge, and it's also um, a violation of our permit. So um, we need to stay on top of that. We also look at septic systems. There's a lot of older septic systems in the town of Scarborough that we need to know where those are. And um, we've done some visual inspections as part of this permit. Um, So MCM4 is um, related to construction site runoff control. So in the planning department, once it gets through um, the planning board, uh, we do sit down and have pre-construction meetings with the contractors and kind of walk through what we expect on the sites. And, and really, it's about keeping, keeping the dirt on the site, really. You don't want it um, leaving the site. And it's a picture up here of the catch basin. These are both pictures, unfortunately, I took in Scarborough, but we were on it immediately, clean up, done. Um, but really, as soon as it gets in a catch basin, it means it goes in a pipe and it, it goes into a water body, so we need to stay on it. And also, as um, storms come through, kind of wash, washing out some of that, you can see the protection they have in place, obviously, are adequate. So we were on top of that, too, and I will say, um, we do... Um, a pretty um, robust inspection um, in Scarborough, and this is just it, is so that if, if DEP comes through, um, we need to know our sites are in, in good order and that it's not a violation on the town of Scarborough. So we've been um, working with developers on that, and they know, um, you know expectations, I think, and, and working with them on corrective actions. and. So I think um, we have a pretty good handle on that now. The next is um, stormwater, our post-construction stormwater ordinance is part of this, um, where they come through um, site plan for the planning board and implement some stormwater BMPs, or stormwater systems, I should say, facilities. Um, and um, they need to annually report to the town of Scarborough that they are maintaining those and that they function as intended. And those um, reports that I get annually, I have to um, document and then report them to DEP. So DEP is looking at how many came through the planning board and how many are being implemented and maintained um, and want us to do um, follow up and inspections of those that are not. So um, they want us to keep a, a good tight handle on those. Next is um, good housekeeping and pollution prevention. This is kind of a, a catch-all. Um, this is where uh, a lot of staff training happens under this MCM. Um, Stephen and I have worked on, on this on um, originally him doing a lot of with the fire department, the police department, there are also departments that maybe aren't as aware of the details associated with this permit, but they are really the eyes out on the street and trying to see and know what to look for. Um, and then also Public Works does a lot of the heavy lifting on this with street sweeping. That's all part of it. That's not just about making our streets look good. That's actually about keeping the sediment from heading into the catch basins again. Um, and also cleaning out those catch basins after the winter sand has been put down. 
uh, and we do those at least once every two years. And then some areas where we see reoccurring more, we have to do it once a year. So we're just keeping on top of that so it doesn't end up in our waterways. And as I keep mentioning throughout this, we really look at it as a team approach. And while public works is the big, big cog there and, and planning, um, community services and the school department also have facilities that they have that fall under this permit and they have to do their diligence on maintaining their fields and their uh, facilities. And then also I mentioned um, the police being out and about and seeing things like an illicit discharge and can call up Stephen or myself and, and notify us. But also the fire department, um, they're critical because they get the response when there's a spill or a car crash. And actually I had the experience of being out. Um, there was a spill near a gas station and they did great responsive and putting down and cleaning it up and documenting that, and that's huge. That's um, a big piece of it. And so I think that goes back to the good training that, that Stephen has done over the years, too. And um, I, I guess um, it, was, it was impressive to see that they put it into action. And so I think that was nice to see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference. Look at that 15 minutes. <laughs> you made it through six. <laughs> um, good. Now I can slow down a little, right? <laughs> um, new permit meets new requirements. So, um, so part of the the new permit is really about a greater public process. And this is, um, we have obviously right now a public process. Um, DEP does that. We say we're doing a notice of intent. We put in this is our permit. Um, the new part of it is every little piece in the documentation at the beginning of the permit that we do specific for Scarborough now, there's pieces of it that now we have to do a public process associated with that. It puts um, a little more emphasis on more of the details that we're working on, which is, is fine. It also puts us a, a kind of a light to some of the other um, environmental activist groups that are working in the area that might want to us to do more, which means there could be funding implications associated with doing more. So we just need to keep aware on this is what the permit says we need to do, and then there might be, um, and maybe that's something this, the town of Scarborough wants to do or the residents want to do, but we got to make sure we understand what that, that budget or the funding and the costs associated with that so we can keep a handle on that. But so it just gives it um, a little more spotlight, I think, on this whole program and what we're doing. Um, we're also in this permit, next permit year, we'll be um, doing an increase in some of the outreach campaigns. Um, we do um, through the Izzywood group, our interlocal stormwater group, we do as a region some awareness and behavior change. And one of the things um, that I'm told is behavior change costs a lot of money because you have to do a lot of follow up and you have to do the results and you have to measure that. And how do you measure behavior change? Um, it's a lot of time and effort and money. And so they've actually ramped up the number of audiences we have to do that to. So it also means it could be a whole nother um, round of um, methods and materials that need to be, need to be um, created and implemented. So there's some costs associated with that. Um, it's a higher degree of um, scrutiny over our programs themselves and having those in writing and the documentation of those, there is a higher standard in this next permit. And we're also, the big thing for us is um, we have two urban impaired streams, Red Brook and Phillips Brook, and right now we consider those our priority watersheds. This next permit really opens up the door and, say, and they want us to say the urbanized area, which really opens up the whole town. And so we're just really implementing everything across the board rather than focusing on certain areas. And um, they also are looking for us to ratchet up our ordinances um, and really have more oversight from the town to really um, oversee um, construction sites, and which means really some of the enforcement that typically would have been done by DEP. And we're looking at, as part of this permit, seeing that 
that would be coming through probably in the first year of our permit is um, some requirements associated with ordinance changes, which puts more burden on our code enforcement officers and um, really um, all staff trying to get out there and do some more inspections and oversight of that, of that program. The other thing with the new permit is there's an overarching implica implication is um, <clears throat> the, the state has um, come up with some plans associated with some uh, what they call impervious cover plan. So saying that um, water bodies that have a high percentage of impervious air, you start to see it in the streams. <coughs> and instead of, because um, we have a lot of water body bodies in the, in the state of Maine, um, they have some limited data, and so they, they did a lot of interpolating and um, came up with a general plan and just caught in, looked at it as a blanketed statewide impervious cover. Um, I will say that Redbrook and Phillips Brook, there is an appendice for each, and it talks about Redbrook having 11% of the watershed is um, currently impervious. They're looking for our target to be eight, and Phillips Brook currently is at 9%, and our target is to be six, which those are not huge numbers, and you look at greater Portland area, when you're just looking, you know what I mean, in the more dense area. However, it's also saying impervious cover, so with any development, which we're having a lot of development in Scarborough, um, that that's more impervious there. So we're kind of trying to work with the faucet still running, like how do you shut that off, right? It's still coming, so we need to look at how we, um, how we do development and how you um, can disconnect that impervious area, which um, is going to be interesting how we kind of walk through that with this new permit, um, because essentially our permit says we can't increase impervious area because we're working against it. So um, we're still trying to figure that out with DDP and, um, and how they're going to enforce that and how we get where we need to be with that. So there's a lot of unknowns, I will say. <laughs> um, so I'm going to stop for questions. Yeah. Um, I'm just uh, thinking ahead to what we're doing this evening later. I'm looking at Millbrook, the yeah. Millbrook watershed. Is that, uh, what's the condition of that particular watershed? Yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> That is, um, Millbrook is uh, just been added to the threatened okay. list, and so basically that's one step from being put on right. the, the urban impaired stream list. I, I wonder, because it's so urbanized. Huh? Right, so basically they are putting it on there and they have to give a reason, and the reason is threat of development. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you walk back the impervious cover? I mean, it feels like once a, uh, I don't see a lot of things being unpaved. Right. So it's a lot of, um, it, and I say it's disconnecting impervious air, and I say that it really means um, taking some existing services, like if we have some large parking lots or what on in the in the watershed, to um, to take those existing services and try to treat them. So we're like doing some retrofit. Um, projects on some of the existing sites as well as new sites making sure we are following um, and, and treating, doing water quality treatment. Um, the state of Maine's threshold for needing to do water quality treatment is I think pr higher than it should be when we're talking about trying to reduce impervious to cover. Um, and so what we're talking about is at smaller sites that might not reach the one acre threshold um, those little bites is what is really kind of killing us. And, and even single family house lots are added impervious cover. Um, I think right now, I don't, I don't know how far you get down into that, but it's really about treating the impervious cover and disconnecting that. So then. Um, what does that mean? So the runoff, you're, you're collecting the runoff and yeah. doing something with it? Yes. Okay. And filtering it or um, things like that. And just and so those sites that do go through site plan and, and where that water is now filtered and collected and sort of treated on site, do those count towards those impervious numbers or are those? That's something that we're still negotiating okay. with. The <laughs> yeah. I think one of the challenges that I think about when I hear these things and 
you know, we've, we've talked about uh, certainly through the comp plan processes, <coughs> these, you know, uh, threatened or impaired watersheds are, are our growth areas. They're Oak Hill, they're the Downs, they're Dunstan. They're the town's historic villages mm -hmm. and, and certainly a growth area like the Downs. So that's a real challenge, I think, as Angela's already pointed out, that we need to really continue to work through is how do we balance these things to try to centralized growth in those areas where we're trying to, where we have infrastructure, we have sewer capacity, water capacity, roads, without sort of sprawling development going where, okay, maybe the streams aren't prepared elsewhere, but they're not prepared because we haven't developed there yet. Right. So it's, uh, anyway. Do, do rooftops, are those considered part of impervious also? They are. <clears throat> Can you give us a, a bit of a report on uh, a septic system management and oversight and controls? Yep. Uh, well, I can tell you what, um, as part of this permit, we we're required to look at um, those, those parcels that have septic <coughs> systems that are 20 years old or greater and showing, identifying what are at risk of if there is a failure um, going into our priority watershed, our priority streams. Um, <clears throat> so we've done an inventory of those, and then um, because it's private property, um, we were able to kind of negotiate with DEP by doing just like what they call a windshield survey. So we actually um, had um, just kind of done a drive-bys to see if there's some, you can see from the ditches if it's in the front of the house or really can't see if it's in the back of the house, but um, actually at the same timing is when we were doing some stuff with Phillips Brook, so I did a lot of walking of the stream, and so I used that an opportunity to kind of look at those septic systems, and we also used um, the opportunity we did some outreach in Red Brook um, and the door-to-door, -door, um, which is the brochure thing that I put in your packets, um, and used that opportunity going to the door to to, to take a look, but other than that, it's really private property, and I don't know if code has any other, I mean, you have to have a, I would think you'd have to have some sort of reason to, mm -hmm. to enter a property like that, so um, that's the limits of, that we've taken it, that I know of. Are there any funds available for people who may have failing systems or really old systems that are insulated in here? You know, like grants or something? Um, I thought there's like a, a loan fund, like a state loan fund, but I don't know. Okay. Development. RD is doing so. Yeah. Okay. Back to the impervious cover. There was a, my recollection, South Portland had to do something recently over by the mall. Uh -huh. um, it was a, a section of road, I think, they had to repave so that it would let, let water go mm -hmm. through. I mean, is that? Yep. I mean, are we approaching that level where we're going to need to start? I assume that was a large investment. From that town, but. Yeah, um, that was a DOT project, um, but the town, I, I believe the city of South Portland does maintain that now, um, but it's its um, a budgeted cost they have to, it's, it's more maintenance, um, I think, after the fact, um, and so I, I'm not sure, I think there's pros and cons, I think you have to have certain equipment to be able to operate that, and so if we went that route, it would make sense if we did it would be not just one, it would have to be something worth doing, and then, because we'd have to probably have some special equipment to be able to maintain it in the future. And, and Mike probably could speak to that a lot more and what he sees on the roads. The, the, maintenance, the maintenance requirements are a little different. Uh, for instance, you can't use any sort of, uh, any sort of aggregate, so anything for wet price control would have to be salt. Um, a, a vacuum sweeper is, is needed uh, because you have a porous pavement, what it is, porous pavement, rock, and then an underdrain system under it. So you have to make sure that you don't plug those pores up and that sort of thing. So it's, it, is, it is more maintenance and you have to be careful about uh, you know, what, what, how, how people are using it and that sort of thing. Probably a, a, probably a better application for future parking lots and that sort of thing. It, that area is in the Long Creek watershed, yeah. and yeah. that is a that's a impaired stream, and so they've taken some really aggressive measures uh, for retrofit, and I think that probably would fall into that category. 
but a lot of private property owners have been doing their own work on their property. And there's some in town too, right? Some um, course pavement applications um, on private development sites. Do farms get heavily regulated under this? Farms? Mm. Yeah, monitored or regulated? Um, not as part of our permit. I know um, some of the other communities like um, Gorm and Wyndham have, um, where we have our impaired lists, um, basically like say threat of development, they might have some associated with um, agricultural um, functions. So that's the only. So they're doing the same pieces that we're doing, but obviously they have to tweak it. And that's why I get back to, we, we really kind of have a broad permit for all the municipalities, and then we kind of tailor it to Scarborough. Brian Longstaff was telling me about uh, a uh, ink test or that can be done to test uh, uh, whether septic systems are leaking or not. Dye test. Dye test. Dye test. test. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that uh, can you mandate that or will you have uh, a suspicion that there's a problem? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> can you mandate <laughs> that? Uh, so our code officers, if there is a, a suspicion of a, a problem with a septic system, I think it needs to be pretty well validated. Mm -hmm. um, they can, I, I know and Brian would be in a much better position to speak to this than I would, but just in my time here, I know it seems like every year I hear the code officers talking about, oh, I put some dye, oh, I was down at, you know, Higgins Beach today, did a dye test, or I was up, you know, Pleasant Hill somewhere and did a dye test. So I, I think it's a fairly, I don't know if common's the right word, but it is a routine activity that they go through when there is a suspicion of a failed system. But it requires the cooperation of the homeowner. I would imagine that we can't just bust in there, but... Uh, <laughs> you can't just bust in the house and dump things down the toilet. Put the dye down the toilet. <laughs> so that's a problem if you have a suspicion, but... Right. But, but, but if there's a clear failing system where you can see muck coming up, then I think the town can take much more aggressive steps. Yeah. <coughs> in, in, in the area of Higgins Beach, I know there's uh, very good historical data on water quality testing, and there are clear markers in those in those tests in terms of phosphates and right. whatever the chemical constituents will are pretty good indicators of uh, mm -hmm. failing system, whether it's laundry detergent or right. you know, certainly the, uh, other materials as well. But finding the source of that problem is a much more difficult problem. Weekly water quality tests at Higgins Beach all summer long. Mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind, given our shellfish, uh, you know, our mud flats, um, water quality is a big, big deal. Oh, yeah. uh, that can cause the closure of flats, and we have some that have been closed for decades, frankly, based on poor water quality. Mm -hmm. what, what about leakage from our sewer system? I recall last year we had an issue with an odor over by uh, on Black Road. Uh, Odor doesn't necessarily affect water quality, but, but um, it could, could be suggestive of a leaker. I think you're, you're referring to the to the pump station over yes. there that, that, that uh, Scott brought that that uh, Santa has been working on. That that was that was simply just the that was the station itself. That wasn't was it a discharge? The, the sanitary district does have a pretty aggressive, robust uh, info. Mm -hmm. They call it I and I inflow and infiltration. Mm -hmm. So there are weak joints in the system, and they do everything in their power to right. identify those and correct those. Uh, and I think they monitor their flows if there's some unique difference uh, based on their historical flows. That's an indicator that they ought to see what's going on there. But our system is fairly new and modern, so I, we don't have many of the problems the old, century-old systems have, uh, just because of the age of our infrastructure. And I think just based on my experience of stuff with the sanitary district, more I think more of the problems they experience is more just groundwater getting into right. their system rather right. than their system getting out. Right. Um, you know, not to say that they may not have breakages here or there, but I think that the leak issue is inward. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, uh, some pumps being connected into the sanitary system. Oh, right. Right. Uh, they don't want to treat water that doesn't need treating, obviously. So. <clears throat> Other questions? All right. 
Um, I'm going to move on then to the watersheds and start with Phillips Brook um, because this is one that we just completed a watershed management plan for. It was a, a two-year grant that we got through the EPA. And um, just to make sure everybody's familiar with, with Phillips Brook, um, and this is where I had my pointer, but um, I think you guys, it basically comes from um, the watershed itself starts at the Saco. This is pretty much the Saco line. And here's the, here's the stream. Um, it, it pretty much starts from the, the town line um, back to um, the crossing at Route 1. Um, and it crosses down, it crosses under Broad Turn and Payne Road and then finally out on Route 1. It comes from Route 1 um, and also covers area just west of the Turnpike. So it's basically the Dunstan Corner area. Um, as Jay had said, is really one of the designated growth areas, and it has been identified as an urban impaired stream. And um, in terms of the watershed in size, it's about one square mile, which for watersheds, that's it's pretty small. Um, but what that also means is that any small changes in the watershed make an, a significant impact, whether that's negative or positive, depending on what, how we, what we are doing in the watershed, it really affects the health of the stream. And this is a watershed that was really, I would call, on the edge. Um, we, while we're not meeting our classification, as DEP would call it, we're, we're pretty much at that cusp. And with every um, new development coming in, though, we're kind of heading a certain direction, so we need to put things in place now. I think this is a savable watershed, I guess is what I would call it, as long as we kind of are a little proactive with it. Um, and I think it's, we're at a point now where, where now's the time to kind of act and, and get this back or try to get this off their list. I think this is a doable one. And so and I so wanted, can you just go back to that and yeah. just uh, show us where the build out of Eastern Village, yeah. excuse me, of Denson Crossing is going? So right now, this is what's been developed now at the crossing. This is phase one, two, and three, mm -hmm. right off broad turn. One, two, and three are here. It will loop around and comes back out to Route 1. So this is the commercial area that we're looking at now. So basically, it's going to cover this whole area, which right now is, is forested area. So that's where um, we've been working pretty closely with the developer. Um, I've included him on, on the watershed management planning we've been doing. Um, they did come through the planning board for amendments. And so even though. Um, so when you kind of open up your permit again, we've, we've worked through with him about kind of ratcheting up um, and meeting today's standards rather than the standards um, for the detention air ponds that he was looking at um, and saying we need to hit at least today's standard and um, for water quality treatment um, because this is something that we're looking really closely at in this watershed. Um, we also looked at some of the stream crossing that he that just went in. Uh, which is, so from Route 1 you come into the commercial area, right here it's, there's a, a culvert crossing before it loops back around. Um, and we had asked for upsizing of that beyond um, really what DEP would typically say this meets the requirement. Um, we kind of worked through with him about this is what it should be as far as the stream health and um, we're able to get to where we needed to be. Um, which, so I think that was a real benefit in that Thank collaboration. So what is a watershed management plan? It's really just a plan or program to um, maintain or restore the health. And as I said before, really Phillips Brook is really focused on because this is our growth area and the urbanization that's happened in that watershed is, is showing now on the stream. And so, the plan is really a roadmap to help protect it. So we're going to kind of stop, turn off that faucet now, and then kind of work in steps to, to, to make it a, a healthier stream. Um, so our first step in the process was really to gather the stakeholders. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, we really just reached out to anybody that would really be affected um, by this watershed. And we held um, a public meeting that we actually sent out mailings to residents in the watershed to try to get even the residents' feedback and just you know their local knowledge and input on any of the issues they saw in their watershed. Um, and I think that was very well attended. And um, I think we got a lot of great feedback and direction 
that really put us on the path for the next um, really 18 months of work that we had done about looking, um, researching the data that had been collected in the past, um, doing a lot of field work, um, really walking the stream and, and just identifying um, really the threats that we found um, in Phillips Brook and really it came down to in the end um, three, three um, substantial or I should say potential threats. <laughs> Um, and one of them, first one being the sediment transport, which, um, which is the lower right, um, really looking at that is actually Phillips Brook. Um, and it's amazing the amount of sediment and silt that is moving through that system. It's pretty incredible. Um, and a lot of that has to do with undersized culverts because it's flooding up and it has that head um, and surcharge that's pushing it through. So the velocity in which um, it comes through that channel is pretty incredible. Um, and in times, you have no flow. So it's just that dramatic difference in the flow regime that kind of goes through that is really eroding the banks and just moving a lot of sediment. And so um, we're finding the amounts. And it's all heading to the marsh. So I think at the end of this, you're, you're seeing it's just getting inundated um, into the tidal portion and into the marsh um, below it. So going back to what Tom had said, and really looking at um, clam flats and, and other, you know, the production downstream is really something that we wanted to focus on. It's really looking at maybe looking at the culverts, fixing those and working our way up and trying to um, stabilize those bankings and, um, and really identifying specific targeted projects um, in the watershed. The other piece, uh, the second one was nutrient loading, and that's really just focused on um, lawn care, pesticide, different things added, fertilizer added to the lawns, um, and then pet waste and other things that um, really just pollutants that are added to the water. Ways. And then the third thing was the chloride levels. And we did find some elevated levels um, in the tributary that comes from the turnpike. So that was no surprise. Um, but it's really something we need to look at is, is the salt that's getting added to the roadways. Um, and I know Mike has a whole program on that. But so that's why I pointed out, I think the highest levels we're finding, obviously, is from the tributary that we knew we would see, but um, just wanted to identify that. <laughs> you, the only way to mitigate that is to use less salt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and to have drivers uh, uh, have a different perspective of what they want their roads to look like during snowstorms and stuff. So there's a, there's a cultural change there as well. It's, and the problem with the, the salt, the chlorides, is once it's in, the groundwater, it's in the groundwater. It's, that's not something that you can treat, like we talked about um, earlier with, um, even with developers, or development of private sites, um, and they treat for water quality, and you're filtering, you can't really filter out chloride. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's really an application piece. You need, to, you need to address it at the beginning, because you can't really treat it on the end. So that's, that's a bigger, um, task, I think, is to try to figure out fluoride issues in all watersheds. Um, and so the plan goals have been, um, as here, protect, improve, sustain, and then we had some action items, which really is just what I just kind of walked through, is, is touching upon the nutrients, the chlorides, the impervious cover. Um, we're talking about replacing um, a lot of the, some of the stream crossings through that. Pretty much, I think about all of them need help. Um, and so we were trying to prioritize, identify those. There's some stream habitat restoration. That's really about reconnecting to the floodplain so that as water regimes, as you have large amounts of water coming through, that it has that level to reach and then spread out. And, and you're not looking at like carved channels. You need to have that area to kind of spread out with large flows. And then citizen outreach, which we've done a lot in other watersheds with like Red Brook and, and really looking at how we can target this watershed for the specific issues in the watershed. And so the next steps for Phillips Brook is really implementation. And there is um, applications coming out this um, spring and early summer. Um, would we would be applying for another EPA grant if um, 
And we're also looking at trying to cobble together funding. Um, there is a w main water bond um, that, <coughs> will, that has, we have an opportunity to apply for um, that would hopefully help us fund for the culvert replacements is what that's for. And cobbling that together with EPA grant, we we're hopeful to try to start with the pain road culverts. Um, those have been flooded out multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at this, and you look at fish passage and, and just, um, just how it's set up, this is kind of a poster child for, okay, we need this open box culvert here. And this is the furthest um, downstream in the watershed too. And so we're just looking at um, kind of building our way up. And um, so you'll see we have put in for the planning department um, in the CIP looking for um, hopefully a match or funding for associated with that. I assume across the through one though, you said the cold yeah. is okay. Yes, this we've looked at that with, um, uh, that is one of the other ones, yeah, we've looked at it. That's a title culvert mm -hmm. and it's also owned by DOT. <coughs> so that's not one that we can really tackle. It has to be the state on that one. So I'm kind of... We might suggest it. we don't want to tackle that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's an expensive one. <laughs> okay, so that's, um, I was gonna transition. Um, that was the end of Phillips Brook. So if you have any others on Phillips Brook, I have any other questions We've got about, that. I'll say five minutes, just because the council will need five minutes to get settled, so. Yeah. Collect your thoughts in terms of how you want to use that last time. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, well, I'm just going to talk five minutes on um, these are the watersheds that I, I talked about Phillips Brook on the bottom. The top red, that's Red Brook, um, which I know we in 2011 we did our plan. We've also done implementation the past three years we've been working at implementation in that, that watershed. And then in the middle in purple is um, we had mentioned earlier is, is Millbrook and Willowdale, which just got added to the threatened. So these are really the high priority for, I guess, staff's focus right now. Mm -hmm. And so Redbrook, our implementation, I just want to point out probably two projects. One is Kayla Lane. This is oh, the before yeah. and after. And I, uh, this is one of the piece, uh, one of the pieces that Mike and I touched on in our, our presentation before was, um, this is really, a, a great collaboration story. Um, this is a public-private partnership. This was uh, a lot of in-house work. We did um, the permitting in-house. We did um, the construction. Um, I saw Mike lay the first block of that wall. I saw Tom Hall with his feet getting muddy out there. Um, we were all, <laughs> I did. <laughs> and um, it, it came out beautiful. I mean, and opened up the stream, fish passage. Um, this is, uh, I think, a real kudos to, um, I think, really tapping into the asset that we have um, and the strengths and playing off the strengths, I think, that we have as staff um, and, and making that a reality, I think, um, it came out really well. And then the other one, last one, is Lazy Boy. This is another public-private partnership we did under our grant. And uh, this was a pond that was constructed in the 90s. Um, and back then, the standard was really about water quantity. You don't want a whole bunch of water going off the site, but quality was not even in the conversation. Um, public Works, um, we went out and basically revamped this entire pond, um, expanded the volume within it, but also added in the far of that after picture is a gravel bench um, and a structure there, and that's really giving it the water quality piece. And this sits right on Red Brook. Um, and so I think it came out really great. Um, and so, again, another kudos to, to staff on that one, because I think um, Public Works did a fantastic job. I would just observe that you took one in March and one in August. I had no choice. <laughs> That's when it was. I will say, Public Works grows the best grass. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was it. So, if you have any questions, I have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As uh, Angela alluded to, you'll see things as soon as uh, uh, within the month uh, regarding the budget in terms of all of this work costs money. I mean, the purchase of a street sweeper is a half million dollar uh, acquisition. And so, uh, I think it's important to, to note that it's not just the aesthetics and keeping our streets looking nice. Uh, we've actually got permit legal requirements we're trying to meet. 
and that there's a lot of staff commitment toward this effort, and it's only going to get greater, I guess, is the real point we want to drive home. And I think a lot of the effort around trying to be sure we stay consistent with our permit, our MS4 permit, so we don't wind up in a Long Creek type situation where we're being mandated to do things, or it, so, um, you know, there might be some pain right now, but it could be a lot worse if we didn't have people like Angela and Stephen staying on top of all the rest of the staff to do our parts. So then the, if I understand correctly, then the, the Red Brook um, that we've had underway for some time, mm -hmm. we're seeing general improvement in the, the water quality. And yeah, so DEP does um, a round of testing, and I haven't got the, the most recent tests on that. Um, so I don't have to be able to close that loop yet. Um, but yeah, the plan was done in 2011, but we've just implemented things over this past couple of years with the last grant, so it would probably take a little while to see that anyway. Um, but they do regularly do their rounds, so every few years they get back to our watersheds uh, and do some water quality testing. And then Millbrook, we said, was kind of on the threshold where we think we might be able to come off a little, little bit of a group. So with uh, Millbrook being added to the list and Willowdale um, already on the list, that is those threatened lists. Um, it, it just puts more of a focus um, and emphasis for DEP, and so they'll be doing more testing out there. Um, and looking and watching closely as that starts to dive, um, and that's where it ends up moving on to an impaired list, and sorry, then it becomes I'm, more of a focus. I think I meant Phillips. Oh, sorry. Phillips is the one that you said was on the threshold and therefore. I, I yeah, um, I think in some cases, um, and it's really, it's it's rock bags. So basically, they put it in the streams and they see how many bugs, and it talks about the variety of bugs and how many bugs and things like that. And I think we're kind of at this point to see the health of the stream. And so um, there are some cases that were right there, close. Um, and so that's where DEP is looking at and saying, well, now's the time to do something. Then so we're keeping it on the list until you can consistently show that you're well above that threshold. Questions? Thank you, Angel. Oh, My husband just texted me from home and says, I hope you guys don't plan to test the bee pool. Because we have 20, I'm <laughs> sorry, with the red, 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 red. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked into that. <laughs> Maybe it's going to test given. Thank you, Angel. We'll take Thank a short you. break and reconvene momentarily. Chair, <laughs>
Here. Councilors Kai Kazo and Hayes are absent tonight as a result of business commitments. So we have uh, the five of us, but we do have a, a quorum. Uh, we certainly have some weather outside. We'll stay focused uh, 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 to uh, accomplish all that we have tonight uh, to respect that weather. Uh, let's start with general public comments. Anyone wishing to uh, make a comment about anything that's not on the agenda, please approach the podium. Close the public comments. Uh, minutes of February 21, 2018, and we'll do these together. March 1, 2018, special town council meeting. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any amendments or comments? All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. No adjustments to the agenda. Uh, the treasurer's warrants will be signed during the course of the meeting. Um, and we will proceed to order number 18-18. 018, a 7 p.m. public hearing with the Planning Board and the Town Council on the proposed contract zone request from Patriot Acura Dealership located at the corner of Payne Road and Hagus Parkway. And the Town Council will join the Planning Board down at uh, the tables in front. So I think what we'll do is ask the applicants maybe to sit on this end of the table, um, the applicants' team anyway. Um, start by going around the table and just introduce ourselves so that everyone knows uh, who everyone else is and what their role is. Why don't we start here? Uh, Sean Bayline, I'm on the Town Council. Jean Marie Katarina, Town Council. Tom Mall, Town Manager. Corey Fellows, Planning Board Chair. Jay Chase, Planning Director. Nick McGee, Planning Board. Susan Oplis, Planning Board. Robin Saunders, Planning Board. Jamal Torres, Assistant Town Planner. Matthew Phillips with American Honda. Tom Talbot, a marketing director for Patriot Subaru and Patriot Act. Jim Seymour, civil engineer and project manager uh, for the engineering portion of this project. Brian Beatty, general manager of Patriot Subaru. Uh, David Richards, I'm an architect with Gallon Church and Architects. I'll be the project architect. I'm Rick Cheney with Drummond Woodson. I'm the applicant's attorney. Mm -hmm. Katie Foley, town council. Uh, Will Rowan, town council. And Bill Donovan, chair of town council. Uh, uh, Corey Fellows is the chair of the planning board, and there's a lot of planning elements to this process. I think uh, Corey's going to lead us uh, pretty much through it, and there is a pretty well-defined process, uh, uh, which the planning board is very familiar with, and I'll turn it over to Corey. Sure, um, and I'll just quickly run through the steps that we're going to go through this evening. Uh, we'll start off with a presentation from the applicant or the applicant's team, and we'll have an opportunity for comments from town staff. Um, then we'll welcome any comments from the public, uh, which will essentially be a public hearing. Um, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond to any of those comments. Um, then there will be discussion among the planning board and the town council, and that may include questions or comments directed toward the applicant. Um, and then there will be um, planning board comments on any land use uh, specific considerations. And then the council will, um, will take whatever action it deems appropriate. So um, that said, I will hand it over to the applicant and we'll uh, hear what you have to say. 
Well, I drew short straw this evening in the absence of Adam Aarons, who's the owner of Patriot Subaru and Patriot Realty, and in this case, Patriot Acura. Uh, Adam is down in Washington, D.C., working on some legislation and has been caught in the storm down there, along with Glenn Reed, who's another uh, team member here. So in their absence, I'm going to do a quick introduction and then turn it over to some of the experts. Um, one of Adams and Patriot Subaru's key components is to use local firms and support the local economy. With that, um, I think you'll notice a common theme this evening with everyone who's involved in this is a local um, professional. First starting off with Brian Beatty uh, from Westbrook, Maine, who's general manager of Patriot Subaru, 14 and a half years, <coughs> leading the Saco location to be the best place to work in Maine for four consecutive years. Patriot Subaru and Saco employ 75 associates, team members, Brian oversees and directs the operation. Second with us is Tom Talbot from Gore, Maine, marketing manager and community manager for the organization for 14 and a half years. Tom has led the community outreach with members of our team and have impacted many charitable events including pet adoptions, health of dealership, blood drives, construction of Habitat for Humanity, House in Scarborough. Tom coordinates our partnership with over 20 charities in Southern Maine and over $1.5 <coughs> million dollars in charitable giving. Glenn Reed, unfortunately, is not here this evening, is a 10-year member of Patriot Subaru, service director, general manager of Patriot Acura, and lives not far from me here in Scarborough, uh, not pre present due to training and, and further preparing for his new position as manager of this uh, dealership. Glenn serves as a lieutenant in Scarborough Fire Department, has lived in Scarborough his entire life. He was raised on Payne Road, less than a quarter of a mile from the location we speak of tonight. Glenn and his wife, Debbie, have lived and raised their family here in Scarborough. Uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Curlew, whose property we are developing, owner of the property, is not able to make it this evening, but I believe she will be listening or watching at home on TV. Rick Cheney, also a Scarborough resident, is our legal advisor for this project and selling requests. Who's Rick? Oh, there he is right here. Uh, Dave Richards uh, from Scarborough, Maine, architect with Gower and Turgeon, uh, also from Scarborough. Dave is the lead architect on this project. Dave. Uh, Matthew Phillips, uh, New Hampshire, uh, sorry, he's the only uh, out-of-state person on this team, <laughs> is the Acura Senior District Sales Manager, uh, Acura Division in American Honda. Uh, we've also had the benefit of working with local real estate agents, both Jerry Appleby from Appleby Commercial Real Estate, representing the seller, and Tom Dunham from NIA, NIA, NAI, the Dunham Group, representing the purchase of the property for the owner. Again, as I discussed, Adam was unable to make it this evening and sends his apologies due to the weather. Well, we have an exciting piece of property here. Uh, it's one of the few gateways that we really have left in this community. It's located on the corner, which you can see behind me on the map, on the corner of Payne and, and Hygis. It's 16 acres directly on the corner with 1,100 feet of frontage on Hygis and 400 feet on Payne Road. Um, We've looked at this property with this team and have come up with a concept that we feel is, is very appropriate for the district, in the HP district. We feel it's going to be a significant feature when one is coming off the, I'll call it the West Gateway, coming off the exit from the main turnpike. We've tried to orient the building such that it gives a, a, a real strong presence there at the intersection and, and you realize you're coming into something special when you're coming off the turnpike. Obviously, we have a lot of features left to really work out the details with, uh, but this evening is our first step on working with the contract zone, and we're looking for your support this evening so that we may move forward working with the planning board on those details. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian, who will give us a little presentation about... Uh, thank you. Yep. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the community, the town council, planning board members, Tom Holland, and the members of his team, Karen Martin. Uh, for attending tonight, despite the weather. I want to give you a little background on, on, on Patriot Super and Sacco. Uh, Patriot Super and Sacco was built from scratch in 2003, so a lot like this is going to happen from scratch. Adam, myself, and Tom, and 13 other members uh, and local people opened up that dealership in November of 2003. Many of those members are still there today. Now, during that time, Patriot Super has grown to be the largest Subaru dealership in the state and one of the largest in New England. Tom, you want to tell them a little bit about our mission statement? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, part of my job is to uh, build a, a brand and to build a relationship with the community. Um, and we are led by our mission statement, which is very simple, two words, it's to serve. And if you're familiar with mission statements, often they're long, you know, 
carefully wordsmith, but, but we just boiled it down to that. And, and under that, we have just one small line, which is to serve the customer, our community, our families, and each other. And you heard earlier, uh, it was mentioned that uh, we were named one of the best places to work in Maine. In fact, we have been best places to work in Maine uh, through that survey for five consecutive years. We've also been uh, Automotive News uh, best dealership to work for for six consecutive years. Um, and it's that last that last part of, of the sentence of our mission statement, which is working and serving each other. So we support each other, uh, you know, extensively at the dealership, help each other out, and it just makes it a, a wonderful place to work. Um, our other awards, uh, we've earned just about every award there is to win from Subaru. But if I were to look at, you know, things that make me really particularly proud, it's our environmental uh, work. And uh, through that, we have, uh, we have uh, earned the first small business in the state of Maine to win the EPA uh, Energy Star Award for environmental work. Um, we have been named, uh, we're the first Subaru dealer in Maine to be uh, the eco-friendly uh, eco dealership. And just last year, and this is really incredible, uh, Cox Automotive, which is one of the largest um, industry suppliers for dealers across the country. They picked one dealer out of the entire United States to be their sustainability award winner. And they picked Patriot Subaru in Saco, Maine, which is really incredible. Um, all of our people, uh, many of our people live uh, in Scarborough. We encourage them to work on our community projects and events. Uh, we are out there, uh, you know, building house with uh, Habitat for Humanity. Um, we have uh, special programs uh, inside where our, our uh, employees are all able to see money go to their favorite charities uh, through a, an employee-directed giving program. All of these things tied together uh, make for a, a terrific place to work and a, a terrific community partner. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Brian, who has some numbers about the dealership. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, when the dealership opened in 2003, there were 16 employees. In 2018, there's 75 employees, all ranging from 18 to 80 years old. The average income earned for our associates is $61,500, and that's with benefits. <coughs> we have provided good jobs, and we know that Acura and Scarborough will provide more good jobs to local people. We believe our compensation numbers will be about the same with the same benefits. We pay 100% of the associates' medical and dental. We feel that's very important, and that's what's made us so successful over the years. Acura, we feel by the maturity standpoint, we'll have about 35 to employee, 40 employees there. So the key to our success is taking care of our employees and actually growing our organization so that we can hire more employees. Tom? Um. Why did we choose the Scarborough and this particular site? Um, when Acura uh, was first looking to uh, put a point in the state of Maine, uh, they interviewed dozens, or at least a dozen, I should say, I mean, a dozen, <laughs> at least a dozen, uh, you know, different uh, dealerships and owners and top, top ones all around. Uh, but they ultimately uh, chose Patriot Subaru because many of the things that, that I spoke of before in terms of our community relations and involvement in many of the things that, that Brian just spoke about in terms of, you know, how we uh, we have such a, a strong force and it's <coughs> doing very well with it. Um, the success is linked right back to that mission statement. Um, you know, if you ask most people who work at a business what their mission statement is, what the company mission statement is, they, they, they couldn't really tell you. But if you ask anyone at Patriot Subaru, they can, and, and we think that's vitally important. Um, so over the many months, uh, we, we we looked at many locations. Most of them were in the Scarborough area, area until we finally <coughs> and chose uh, this specific location. And we chose Scarborough because of its community and its very thoughtful growth patterns. Uh, we chose this area because of uh, our desire to provide really strong and good paying jobs to the town. Uh, we chose it because of the, the family orientation that, that Scarborough has uh, and has developed and cultivated over the years. And simply, we chose Scarborough because it is the right place for an accurate dealership. Um, 
So with that, Brian, <coughs> closing remarks. And of note to the town, Mrs. Curlew, upon the sale of the property, will be selling her assessment with the uh, property in full. We are aware and here to address any questions you may have, especially as it relates to why we need a contract zone agreement, which is due to one reason, only the prohibition on outside sales, which we do, we're not arguing about. In 14 and a half years in Saco, we've never sold a car outside the building. Of note, there are two luxury uh, auto deals in Scarborough today, Mercedes-Benz and Land Rover Jaguar, both of which receive contract zone variances for the same issue as we're here for. We are part of the community today, and we want to be a bigger part of the community in the future. To take you through some of the details and specifics of the project, Jim Seymour of Sebago Technics will uh, speak about the property and our design, um, followed by Richard and David talking about zoning agreements and some other, and design, right? Design. Okay, excuse me, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna move the easel in here a little bit. <laughs> Swing that mic around a little bit too. Okay, I'll move it back a little bit. So, as you can see, the location um, this being Nigus, this being Payne Road, this being your exit off of the main turnpike. Currently, there is a gas station here, Famous Days here, Ski Outlet and Clear Choice here, Golf facility as well. Uh, this is the location for the new project that we just approved uh, Gateway Commons. So you can see our location is central to coming off the turnpike and we want to take advantage of that high visibility. The lot, as I mentioned earlier, is 16 acres, former resident, or actually current residents of Jacqueline Curlew. It's an old residence um, and it's just a nice piece of wooded land right now. The development, uh, they have a home, a garage, and another shed located out here. Uh, the front is very barren. And as you come into Scarborough, you just basically right now look at, you know, some woods, a little bit of wetlands. The site um, is traversed by a stream which comes through this development, cuts across the corner like this. There are figures of wetlands throughout. I'll get into that in a little bit more time. But as you can see from the aerial photograph, or I know it's a little far away, uh, it's mostly a wooded lot. Uh, the challenges on the site are obviously wetlands and poor soils. Uh, it's a silty clay soil, which we'll have to deal with with the building uh, construction. As I mentioned, 1,100 feet of frontage here and 400 feet of frontage on Payne Road. We anticipate with our design to use the entrance to the existing home and the existing curb cut that's already been established off of the parkway. Into our actual design. I think you all have copies of this. But what we've done is we've placed the building such that it is oriented the front, the main focus of the building is oriented to the corner. Right now, this is showing us uh, 20,876. We're still working on that. Uh, Adam would actually like to trim that down so it would be under uh, 20,000 square feet. But it would be basically a, a typical uh, dealership with a showroom, service, um, and uh, service area here as well. What we are focusing on, and we think that it's going to be the major component, is outdoor display. Obviously, they are a car dealership. As part of their business, they need to display and present their products. I noted that uh, in the commercial district standards, it recommends that all the parking be placed behind the building or on the sides, um, and it, I think the term is the majority. What we've tried to do here is limit how much area here we're going to have for display, and we've tried to mimic what we've seen with some of the other car dealerships, uh, in particular uh, Prime Mercedes on Route 1. The idea would be this would be this whole area would be slightly elevated, such that it's three or four feet higher than your eye would be here at the intersection. Possibly some nice landscaping features, maybe some rock walls, maybe a low retaining wall. Uh, some kind of feature with some nice landscaping in front of it, and then the idea would be that we have some nice, uh, accurate cars uh, lined up along the front. I think it's also important, which I don't know if we've heard yet, but this is going to be the first accurate dealership in the state of Maine. Uh, another, you know, key component and nice feature to present here at Scarborough. 
So going forward, as you can see, this gray area out here is the majority of inventory. Um, right now we have over 300 car locations for inventory uh, located out there. Our plan for circulation would be, as, you, as most car carriers would be coming from the turnpike area, would be coming from Payne Road, and we've designed this nice long stretch so that the car carries and everything would be totally internal to the site. I think we've seen in some other locations here in southern Maine that sometimes there's not enough area for that to occur, and unfortunately the car carriers stop on the side of the road and unload. We, we've addressed that. We've made this nice long stretch so there's plenty of room for those car carriers to get well off the road and not distract any drivers. As well, it presents a nice circulation pattern so that we can come back out on the Hygus. The idea is that most customers will come in, circulate through the service area or through the showroom area, be able to park and then return back out in that flow pattern. Currently, we've only done preliminary numbers, but we're well under the uh, uh, limits for the main traffic movement permit, but we'd be well above what is required by your town under your own impact fees. So that will be something that we'll be working with the players going forward. The general design of this, again, all the stormwater and everything, what we'd like to do is take advantage of some nice natural features here, uh, make a, a nice stormwater treatment pond here as part of a feature, and then, and then in sequence do an infiltration pond uh, to this side. Here, this blue line, which you may not be able to see, is actually portions of the street. There's a large culvert that crosses the parkway. This area is pretty much off limits due to the setbacks with the stream. Here in the middle is a finger of wetlands, and here is kind of a man-made ditch which has been classified as a wetland. These will be impacted. At this time, we anticipate the wetland impact to be 14,000 to 15,000 square feet of wetland impact. This is the current home, uh, sorry, this is the current home garage, and there's another shed on the property. This area here is about the only thing that's open. The rest is wood. When we get done with this, what we've discussed is we'd like to be able to thin this a little bit, save some of the specimen trees, make it a nice canopy in there, possibly make this a nice pedestrian area, and leave this all natural so it would be buffered uh, in either parking area. Uh, utilities are all there. Uh, electrical services, sewer, water, everything would be coming from uh, either the parkway or King Road. We'll get into those designs as we move forward with the planning board. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave, who will discuss the building itself. Capacity that we may need to share. Again, my name is Dave Richards with Gallery Church and Architects. Um, the building is approximately now 20,000 square feet. It's about 202 feet long at its, long, at its longest uh, measurement and uh, 138 feet wide. Um, it's comprised of essentially two components, which would be the uh, sales incline area and then the service area. multiple masses, so over that 20,000 square feet, we raise up, we lower down, we pull forward. Um, the glazing is related, but in many forms, so that we can create punches alongside of the building, and then use into the showroom 
the high laskers are added who would Voice over on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <the> comic relief. <laughs> so, yeah, just turn it off. So, so we have, um, you know, the, the glazing, the pie lasters, and the relief in the exterior materials to, to bring down the scale of this relatively large building and to provide visual interest. This band that goes around helps to lower the scale of the building and to tie those masses together and to kind of signify what I would call the surface area of the building, or the client area, the building and client contact areas. There is a dark band of material down around the base that circumscribes the whole building that helps to create a base and to kind of put the building on the piece of land. Um, the materials of construction are Metal panel, nothing is high gloss. Excuse me. This is a heat metal. I don't think we can hear you. Can okay. you speak yeah, up a little bit? Uh, sure. I'll stand a little closer. Yeah, yeah this configuration is a little tricky. How far back would you like to be? I think if you just direct yourself to project towards Fine. us, that would make a big difference. Sure. So the materials <laughs> of construction are metal. They're metal, they're not high gloss, they're matte metals. The band is a metal band. The body is what I said, synthetic stucco, but that's just a nice word for ephus, which is a flat, you know, surface with a you know, looks like texture to it, which is common in the area. Um, and that's about it. Any questions? I have a question. Is is this um, a standard um, building design that Acura requires? If I know a lot of the. Uh, Car dealerships require, you know, they've got to be a certain style and whatever because that's the brand. Yeah. There are elements. Oh, okay. May I? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yes, this would be uh, fairly close to what we would call a standard prototype. Mm -hmm. What will happen if, if the project goes forward, we have a design team that comes out and works with the, the dealership as, as well as any local requirements okay. um, to, to customize it to the location. So you have some... Some flexibility. There is there. Design. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll work with. Yep. Thank you. It's not hard and fast. Thanks. Yep. Does the applicant's team have anything else to add before we move on? Yeah. I think we'd like to have Rick Shanae just briefly go sure. over the the actual contract zone agreement itself. The um, the Mercedes Benz dealership, the Jaguar Land Rover dealership, and this proposed dealership all are subject to the same limitation under the ordinance, which is the definition of outdoor sales and services. It specifically includes new and used car dealerships that are not fully enclosed. So when you look at the ordinance in the Haggis Parkway District, permitted uses include retail sales and services, excluding car washes, uh, automobile repair and service facilities, and outdoor sales and services. So in order to go ahead, uh, the council needs to, in effect, grant uh, a relief from those provisions under the ordinance, just as it did with Mercedes and Jaguar. When I drafted the agreement, uh, being perhaps a little overly cautious, I included and, and this this building will have a fortune where they can wash cars, they can sell a car, you clean it up, that sort of thing. Um, it'll also have um, repair and maintenance section. So I, in, in the contract zone agreement, the draft, which is in your materials, I note that the facility will have automobile washing facility services, and of course there's an outdoor sales and service as defined in the ordinance facility. So the contract zone agreement, in effect, provides relief from those provisions of the ordinance so that the project can proceed. I have not included anything else in the agreement by way of any conditions or things that the council may wish to impose um, for obvious reasons, but the basic agreement that uh, is, is, is needed for those for those reasons. And that's about it. Thank you. It's all set from your, from your end? I think so. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, before we move on to sort of the next step, um, among the steps that I outlined earlier, I just want to briefly step back and there there have been a couple of references to future steps, depending on what happens this evening. And I'll just, for the benefit of the public or anyone else who 
wants to try to follow along, I'll just quickly outline those just at a little bit of a higher level. So tonight is what we refer to as phase one, which is the joint review by the planning board and the town council, which also will include a public hearing. Phase two is planning board plan review. Uh, if we get to that point where we'll really drill down on site plan review and really get into a lot of details around <coughs> circulation and architecture and, and stormwater and all those fun details that we go through. Um, if that moves forward, <coughs> then uh, town council would take action and have a couple of readings, and including a public hearing. Um, and then if the council approves the contract zone, then it comes back to the planning board for final final approval. So um, it's a very, uh, very deliberate step-by-step -step process, and this is just the beginning. Uh, and I thought it'd be helpful maybe just to quickly sketch that out for, for everyone. Uh, so the next step uh, in phase one for this evening is uh, comments from town staff. Jay or? Sure. Um, yeah, and actually what I might do is just jump off where Rick left off there just a moment ago in terms of sort of the, the legal review of the contract zone. At this point, Tom and I have, have talked with, we've spoken with our town attorney, generally let him know this is coming, but we haven't asked him to do a formal review yet of the contract zone until we get through this portion. We didn't want to start, you know, spending resources and time and energy if, you know, we want to see where this goes tonight. So certainly a lot of the details that Rick was talking about are things that we have, as Corey just sort of talked about, multiple bites at the apple here along the way. So there'll be ample time to be sure we have everything just right and sort of T's crossed and dies audit. But <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but again, we, we want to be sure Council's comfortable, and that's really what tonight is about, and getting uh, planning board uh, feedback as well. Um, so just in terms of staff comments, I really provided a couple of memos leading into tonight. One was really about process, but I think at this point we're now really starting to talk about the contract zone itself and, and the use in, um, in that process. And so I laid out a memo just I did highlighting a few um, areas as staff, Jamel and I, Angela and our team really looked at the, uh, the initial plans just at, at a high level. Again, we didn't want to dive too deep, but just really thinking about the implications of, of the use. And I think it was mentioned by the applicants team how this is really, this is one of the gateways to the community. Um, and so really thinking about the orientation and building placement, I think will be critical. Uh, the Haigas Parkway zone itself really highlights that and it requires actually a, a 25 foot uh, landscape area between uh, the road and the building um, and then as was already referenced parking's really identified to be sort of at the side and rear so talking through those elements and how you know if there are to be vehicles um, in front of the building maybe they're part of sort of more of a landscape design or display um, but those are some of the things to be thinking about we also have design standards for corner lots this is obviously a corner lot right at the intersection here. Um, and so just being mindful of those things. And again, they, they echo a lot of the site orientation, uh, really having the bu building present itself um, to, to the intersection um, at that corner. Um, and thinking about sort of architecture and the materials that are used also be key. I think one of the other uh, components that staff flagged in our memo really had to do with traffic and flows, thinking about um, uh, the access off of Payne Road as well as Hygus. And, and in terms of the uh, Payne Road intersection, thinking about uh, how it relates to uh, the proximity to the Ginn Road intersection and, and realizing that there is additional capacity for development at that intersection on the abutting property. And, and actually when the gas station across the st street went in, uh, which actually also has a, a pre-approved restaurant site, um, <coughs> noted that, that that intersection is getting close to the tipping point of needing a, a traffic signal. So just being mindful of those things as we go through the process, I think will be uh, will be important. Um, so I think those are a couple of the elements I just want to highlight that were in the memo and here to answer questions as we go. Thanks, Jay. Um, at this point, I'll offer the opportunity for for any public comment. If you'd like to say anything, come on up to the podium. Just give us your name and address and. Keep your comments to five minutes or less. I don't have a gavel, but <laughs> we'll open it up. 
Uh, good evening. I'm Larry Harrow at 9 Security Drive. I gave my disclaimer to this, this group last night about being in banking and not in uh, land development. Um, I live in the area. I'm close by, and a couple of the counselors live even closer than I do. Um, I think conceptually it's, it's a, a good fit for the town. It's a good place. Uh, it's not going to be a high volume traffic area. Um, I don't know as far as the buffering around, as far as the economy you were talking about, I don't know about those things there. But I think it's a good fit generally. Uh, low impact on the town, um, not requiring a lot of town services here. Uh, certainly top flight car line with Acura. Uh, the folks at Patriots Subaru have been here for many, many years and they've talked about their history and their, their beliefs and, and their uh, commitment to, to being green and their community involvement. I think these are all positive things for our community. And certainly they had to compete with, as they mentioned, many other dealerships uh, in this state top quality ones and they, they uh, prevail with Acura, so I think that says a lot right there. I guess one thing, um, the only thing negative, and again, I don't know anything about this, these things, but certainly being a car dealership, a large part of that, that land is going to be paved over, so I know the planning board is always talking about the impervious mm -hmm. uh, area and, and percentage of coverage, so I don't know if there's an alternative to just you know, our normal paving or not. That would be my only question or concern right now. But I think I do support it. I hope the town council supports it and that uh, everyone can work together. And, uh, we have a nice, uh, nice dealership setting. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> my name is Mark Lorry. Sorry, can I just ask you to swing that mic up right in front of you? There you go. Thank you. Mark, <clears throat> Mark Loring, High Woodmore Road, South Portland. I own the abutting piece on Payne Road. I've owned it for about seven or eight years. I had an option on this piece for about a year. Really did a lot of diligence on trying to find a fit. Um, and uh, the world's changed since 20 years ago when we put in, when Pegasus was put in, and the whole retail landscape has changed dramatically with online shopping, um, different trends. Um, so I really think this is a good fit. Um, I've never met anyone from Patriot Super. I don't know any of them. I have no vested interest in this. I did do a little guerrilla warfare and find out <laughs> what they like. I have a lot of friends in the car business. And uh, they all said, stand up, seriously. They said that they're a stand up group, very well run, honest as the day is long. Um, not that that's unusual for a car dealer. Um, but really, I did hear nothing but positive, positive things about this outfit. Um, so, like I said, I just want to make sure that they know and the town knows that as the direct, only a butter, other than the back part that Scott Brown's property is, that I'm fully supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll close that out then. Thank you. Appreciate the input. And at this point, I'll give the applicant's team an opportunity to respond. I don't think there's anything you need to rebut. Uh, but if you have any, any thoughts based on anything you've heard. I think we're looking for feedback from you at this point. Yeah, I think it was pretty positive comments from the public. All right, so um, I, I'm sure that members of the planning board and the council will have some questions, possibly concerns, and we'll, we can get it, start getting into that discussion now. So the next step here is discussion among members of the planning board and the town council. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just open it up, maybe starting with, with members of the planning board, kind of keeping in mind that as we discuss, this is sort of a higher level uh, first step at this, first look at this, and um, that if this does move forward, we'll have the opportunity to really get into the weeds, literally and figuratively, on a lot of things. But as Jay alluded to, I think it's probably appropriate to focus on things like building orientation, overall architectural feel, um, buffering, traffic patterns, and things like that. But with that, I'll uh, welcome any comments. Susan? <laughs> Why not? Uh, 
I've known in Scarborough for really, really, really disliking contract zones. <laughs> I think it's spot zoning, and I don't care which way you slice it, it's spot zoning. But it's here, and we've already experienced it, and here's another example. The good news is I think this is the best place mm -hmm. to have something like this. The other two that we have, not so much, but this one seems to me to be proposed for an area that, first of all, is not um, traffic-wise, <coughs> impact-wise, it's going to be a whole lot less intense than it might be in some place else. So I'm feeling very comfortable about that. Um, I have some questions about the architecture, but not much. One quickie, is this the color it's going to be? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> I thought the record show that he shook his head no. Yeah. <laughs> I can just tell the printers are mean. I'm, I'm, just, I'm known for two things, landscaping and really, that color? So just want to make sure. We'll, we'll see more of it later, and yes. that's fine. And we'll bring samples. <laughs> okay. Cars? Um, yes. And I, I, will, I will start, not start, I would like to just, one of my major concerns is always landscaping. And in this particular area, we've got a really good thing going in that most of the parking, most of the um, inventory is going to be in the back. And I think that that is a big plus to this. So I want to make sure that the part that does face onto Hygus Parkway and does face onto Payne Road is very intelligently and creatively landscaped. That will be very important to us. And if you want to find out how not to do it, go to Prime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, there's no sense pretending that that is absolutely unacceptable, but we can do nothing. It doesn't seem we can do anything about it. I understand the problem is that we don't want to hide the cars, but where's the creativity? So I, I'm going to be looking at something really nice, really creative, where we're trying to, especially, you know, right here with, with, on the corner, where we see this great building, it's going to be a very nice building. So let's have the landscaping complement this very nice building. I am sure that my um, partner over here is going to talk about it, one of the biggies that we're going to talk about, which is impervious service and stormwater management, but I'm not getting into that because I'm the landscape lady. Uh, traffic impact is obviously very big. Um, I'm a little not concerned, but I'm looking forward to seeing what we're going to do when the, what the buffering is going to be towards the back because at the same time that we're doing this, we're talking about the development mm -hmm. of the um, Crossroads. Crossroads. And there's going to be residential and, you know, if necessary, you might even want to work with these people to decide how it's going to abut and what's going to be needed to make the, con the transition from what you're doing to what they're doing be smooth. Um, we just saw them last night, so the timing of this is really great. Um, let's see. Stand up people. I really like that phrase stand-up people. We're a stand-up town. And I think that what we like is to make sure that everybody knows what we look for and that you're going to let us know exactly what's going on and there'll be no surprises. And in something like this, the devil is in the details. You know, this is, this is very complex and it's very large and it has multiple impacts for a huge part of the town. So it may take a little while. So just to let you know that we expect that no, we're, we're going to be cooperative, and we expect that you're going to be cooperative. Um, collaboration is what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned. Um, are we going to tear down the house that's there? Yes. Yes, I figured that, but I just wanted to ask. This is a totally ridiculous question, but I'm going to do it anyway. A1, A103, picture of the building. What are those little red things across the top of the building? Oh, that's just dividing the two areas. Mm -hmm. It's just showing me that that way the areas, they're not a difference in height or anything like no. that. Okay. It's just to say that one side is where the workshop is and the other side is okay. where the it was, I was not sure whether it was a height areas. elevation thing. Yeah. It is. Okay. No, but the elevations I hope will. Yeah. Anyway, <coughs> I'm sure that when you come in front of the board for the specifics, you know, we'll get down into the real nitty gritty. But I don't have any real <coughs> problems with this. Like I say, I really like where it is. I like the first blush of this building. Um, it's all going to be in the, the, the details as we get into it, so looking forward to it. Thanks. Yeah, Robert? Um, I'm going to echo 
a little bit of what Susan said here, um, the contract zones, it really kind of is akin to spot zoning. It's, we know this is not allowed here, but we're going to try anyways. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from where I sit as a member of the planning board, there's nothing here in this presentation that causes me any hesitation whatsoever to say that it's not something we can't get done. I'm sure it can get done. It can look good. We can make sure it's done well. The real question that's before us is, you as the town council, is is this the vision we had for Highgus Parkway? Is this what you want at the entry of Highgus Parkway? Is this the best use of that land at, at this entryway of Highgus Parkway? And only you as a town council can really go through those steps. So as a member of the planning board, what I've seen here presented to me tonight, it's nothing we haven't, you know, weeded through before. And it's, it looks like a fine plan. It looks like the other dealerships that have gone through this. So that being said, the follow-up question that is, you know, if you're going to allow dealerships on Haggis Parkway, is it going to be just this one? Why not open it up? Why not have a, the zoning allow for it? Uh, why not a zoning change rather than a contract zone, which is essentially spot zoning? So those are things that I think the council should be considering as they go through this process. If you find it it's suitable in all other respects, and then you kick it over to the planning board, I look forward to working with uh, this group and, and the plans that they presented. That's kind of from where I'm sitting. That's that's really, I think, the biggest hurdle is is what the vision here is for the community and that, that stretch of uh, zoning out there. Thanks, <coughs> So this is my first um, go around with contract zoning, and so you can you can totally convince me that contract zoning is is the way to go because I've been doing my homework. I read that the definition of contract zoning is that the property owner rezones and thereby agrees to some imposition of some certain conditions and restrict restrictions. That, that otherwise wouldn't be imposed in the other zone because here I think what we're looking for is that the contract zone has public benefit and the public benefit that I'm going to look for is what you're doing to enhance the ecosystem. Um, you are at the gateway to Scarborough, you are at the gateway to Scarborough Marsh and I firmly believe that Scarborough is a jewel and it's probably part of the reason that you're coming to Scarborough is uh, it not only our way of life, how we look at our natural resources, our, the strength of our community is really this, is the Scarborough Marsh, the beaches, the tax base that that brings. Um, I think this can be mutually beneficial. So what I'm going to be looking for is you all to recognize the ecosystem impacts and to mitigate that appropriately. Um, do you have a landscape architect on your team? Yes. Excellent. So just like Susan said, we're going to be looking for some real creativity there to see what we can do so that you guys get your waiver and we get what we need for the public benefit. Okay? Um, I'm going to press hard probably on, um, the, well, let me ask this. What's the timing of the agreement? Because, you know, uh, according to the, the Section 5A, we can we we have the ability to put some preservation of open spaces and buffers in there and contributions of municipal services. So, do we still have time to think about what's going into the the contract agreement? Very Plenty of so. time. Okay, good, excellent. So, <laughs> thinking of that, what um, what we'll be looking for is preservation. Exactly what that says: preservation of open space and buffers, and how we can use them <coughs> to. Um, keep the surrounding area, stay compatible with the surrounding area, which we said was the Scarborough Marsh. So how could we potentially bring the Scarborough Marsh to the car, car dealership? Um, you know, really innovative things like that. The other thing is you're going to be replacing 1,500 square feet of wetlands with thousands. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the honesty, Jim. <laughs> Much appreciated. 15,000 square feet of wetlands. And keep in mind, those are like little pockets of the Scarborough Marsh that didn't quite make it to the big league. Okay? So those are little pockets of Scarborough Marsh that no longer are going to be providing flood attenuation to this town. And instead, you're going to be putting hard surfaces over them. And now you're going to be adding to the flood impacts of the town and adding to the 
to the municipal services of the drainage that's out there, of the culverts that are out there. We need to think about off-site improvements that meet, are needed, not just traffic signals, but I know we got some flooding issues out there and we don't wanna, we don't wanna push it over a tipping point, okay? So I'm putting, I'm very straightforward per person. I'm putting all my cards on the table the, and town staff knows exactly what I'll be looking for. Flood attenuation. I'll be looking for you to take town, the town engineer to your DEP pre-application meetings and keep town and town staff very much involved with all of your, your DEP Army Corps permitting because one thing we need to remember as a community is just because we get our environmental protection permits from DEP and Army Corps does not mean that we've completely satisfied and fulfilled the environmental protections that we need in this town. Okay, and as my colleague has said over and over, all of the uplands in Scarborough have already been developed. You know, all of the good upland properties, <coughs> what we're left with is sort of like a, a hodgepodge of uplands and wetlands and lowlands. And it doesn't matter if it's low value wetlands, it provides a service, an ecosystem service. So um, I don't have anything specific for you other than really think hard about what, how you're gonna sell those wetland impacts to us and what we can do to capitalize on that, whether it's off-site improvements, whether it's innovative um, stormwater treatment. We talked about needing to disconnect stormwater impervious cover here. So, you know, the sky's the limit here. So, um, you got, you know, we have something you want and you have something we need, which is help preserving our ecosystem. So, we really appreciate the opportunity to work with you on that. Thanks, Robin. And I just very, very quickly echo a lot of what my fellow board members said, um, including really what Robin just said about the, what I think is the most logical public benefit to come out of this, which would be preservation of that ecosystem and, and enhancement of that and, you know, potentially some greater connectivity. It is fortuitous, as Susan mentioned, that just last night we had a workshop with the folks who were planning for the large scale and long long-term uh, redevelopment of the crossroads, of the uh, Scarborough Downs site. And one of the things we talked about that was kind of a recurring theme was connectivity to trails and things like that and trying to really take advantage of that, of that landscape that's there. And so I do agree on that, on that note that we, in addition to really focusing on that buffering and landscaping at that very prominent gateway corner, that we also be mindful of how it relates sort of in the, in the, at the back and as it transitions into that crossroads area. So I think it is, um, it's kind of a happy confluence of events that this is all these conversations are happening right now. Um, you know, the Hygus corridor um, in the over 10 years that I've been on the planning board, um, the thinking about that has really evolved as the economy has changed and other, you know, as it was mentioned, retail trends have changed. Um, we were gonna have Fairchild Semiconductor there, there was gonna be, you know, there's gonna be high-end office, and um, I think it's to the credit, it's, it's a credit to the town at all levels, staff and boards and council and others, that um, we've been able to be fairly nimble about how we think about that corridor and that gateway while still, while being thoughtful about it and not just sort of uh, going out and approving the first thing that comes in the door, um, because there are definitely um, also serving on the Long Range Planning Committee, I know there, there's been a lot of interest, as with one would expect, in that exit 42 area from a lot of different uh, potential users. So I think um, it's good that we've been thoughtful and deliberate about it. And I'm not generally a huge fan, I'll get this out of the way too, I'm not generally a huge fan of the contract zone concept, but there are benefits that do come from it um, in terms of being able to um, to get some, some concessions and other things out of uh, applicants that we might not otherwise be able to get. Um, you know, they can be an administrative burden sometimes going forward, uh, sort of keeping track of all those promises that have been made. Uh, but I think we have the staff and the, and the, and the other uh, resources to be able to do that. I agree that uh, I don't see anything here as a, you know, putting my planning board hat on that I see as being sort of a potential deal killer. Um, I, I do appreciate the fact that there is the opportunity for better um, circulation here when it comes to the, the car carriers, and I think we've all seen 
uh, we've all seen in other parts of town where they stop literally in the middle of Route 1, um, which is not a great feature. Um, so I think, uh, I think that this lends itself to a more logical setup there. Um, I think we're on the right track in terms of architecture. And again, if this moves forward, we'll have ample opportunity to, to go into more detail on that. Um, and obviously, wetlands and, and everything else and stormwater. Um, so with that, oh, I did want to I did want to make one comment, um, and this is sort of a pet thing of mine, and I don't mean an nitpick, but in the benefit section, uh, benefit uh, impact analysis section, one of the things that was cited as being a benefit to the town is that it's not housing, and that it's sort of <laughs> implying or stating, really stating that housing would you know, be a, a, ben, a burden to the town, a net burden to the town, and I think um, you know it's that's. That's a, a, a common assertion and, and perception that I think has been pretty well debunked at this point, and I don't mean to overstate it or belabor it, but um, I just wanted to say for the record that I don't see it's not housing as being a, a benefit. So that's not to take anything away from this proposal, but I just wanted to, <laughs> wanted to put that out. So with that, um, I will turn it over to the members of the council if they have any comments or questions. Yeah, I think we'll go around to, and allow each town council member. Katie, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think you can tell we have a uh, extremely talented planning board, and they have a process in place to get into the devil of all those details. So I trust that they're going to fully vet and work through those pieces with you. I love whatever each of you had to say. Um, landscaping is hugely important to me as well, as are the environmental impacts. And consider, uh, or, or something for us to all think about, it is the gateway, a really nice welcome to Scarborough uh, sign or something worked in there could be uh, appropriate. So I'll keep my comment short. Thank you. Will. So I sat through a presentation this evening from our town engineer, and I'm mm. now an expert on uh, <laughs> municipal M4 right. permit application. MS4. So, MS4, thank you. Uh, so I share the ecological concern uh, around the impervious surface and oh, runoff and word. culverts and <laughs> wetlands. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, so I'd like to echo uh, what Robin said around, like, we really want to, um, we have a lot of, um, values in the community um, that we want to make sure that they get uh, uh, recognized around preservation of open lands, um, ecological impacts. Um, we talked about housing. You know, there was a contract zone that was done across the street where the developer made a very nice contribution to the affordable housing fund in town. Um, certainly, you know, Mm -hmm. This doesn't necessarily have a historic impact, but something that we've talked about is, is a need to preserve some of the historic nature of, of town, of the uh, infrastructure in town, some of the, the sites and properties that are um, falling into disrepair, and, and again, some kind of community um, uh, public benefit um, is something I might be looking for. Because when I look at this, um, my first, uh, uh, when, I, when I read through, I, I recognized that Patriot um, Subaru has been a terrific community member in the town of Saco, um, but um, I think when we when we had the, the drawings up tonight and I looked at it, I saw a beautiful piece of uh, woodland um, that is about to become a very large parking lot, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so um, I just I have some concern about that. And I wonder if this really, if we really should, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, to Nick's point, I'm, I'm I'm definitely hesitant to say that we change the zoning so that we allow um, a you know more car dealerships in town. I think we, I'm not certainly not prepared to do that tonight. Um, in general, I, I think I'm, I'm certainly haven't seen anything that I'm opposed to. I thought the presentation that was put together in written form was really, really thoughtfully done. And the presentation tonight was terrific. Um, but, uh, but I definitely have some concern over um, if, if this really is what we want at that corner um, and if that really is a, um, the best use of that land. Hold that Thank you. Thank you. John? Oh, I'm sorry. Could I, I have one more point? <laughs> I, I, I also read in the packet that um, that there was fiber on, on oh. Payne Road, and I, it, it was something that I wasn't um, familiar with. Did, do you know how, how that got into the packet around there being no, fiber? It was just telecommunications. It wasn't meant to be it, fiber. It was just telephone. Gotcha. So something else to consider is that the, um, the uh, three-ring binder uh, actually does connect through mm -hmm. Hygis, but it's all the way down on the other end. Uh, one benefit, if 
that um, may be mutually beneficial uh, might be to run that, that uh, fiber optic on an open network um, just down Haggis, um, and that would get us to, to Payne Road. Um, I, we had a great conversation a couple weeks ago with uh, GWI, who's, who's uh, one of the owners of the Three Ring Binder, um, and they're looking for public-private creative partnerships that could be done that might, um, uh, so that they could create an open network in, in town and expand the fiber offer. So. It's at the um, Dunstan Corner end of town? Uh, no, it, it actually runs up Route 1, but it yeah. comes over Scotto Hill at the, right. that end of um, Haggis. Okay. Um, and then I'm not exactly sure where it goes from there. Thank you. Sean. Thank you. Um, I have absolutely no problems with contract zones as long as they serve a purpose for the town as a whole as a, and for its benefit. Um, I was actually on the council, I think I'm the oldest one on the council, uh, when Haggis Parkway was a discussion. Um, so I can say that this does not fit what was originally envisioned for the parkway. However, that vision has to change over time based upon our needs as well as the needs of the community. And I think that this is a very good fit for that. And I am very glad that we have a very competent planning board that's going to take care of the details, including landscaping and um, architecture. So um, that's for them to talk about. But I hope this moves forward. Yeah, um, I'll be right up front, uh, and I'm not a fan of contract zones at all. Um, however, I do see the benefit the way we've got them structured here in Scarborough, um, and I and I will just reflect that we all, we do we have a great planning board who are going to take care of the details and, and do I think what needs to be done that's in the best interest of of the town. My whole thing with contract zones is, as Susan said, is, you know, what's the public benefit? I mean, uh, there's good pro quo here, and, and uh, pro bono publico, too, if you want to go down that line. Uh, you know, what's the public good? Um, and I know that, you know, we've heard some things mentioned. Another thing I would mention is, um, you know, some contributions to environmental or sustainability programs here in town, uh, land trust, uh, there's just a whole lot of, of options. So I look forward to uh, working with um, the folks from uh, your company to see what we can work that's of a mutual benefit. So, Thank you. Um, I'll, just, I'll just share some really almost random thoughts uh, because this is an introduction really for us. but. Uh, uh, I think it is true that your excellent reputation precedes yourselves. Uh, 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 Patriot in Saco is very respected, uh, and I think I would speak for the whole council that we very much appreciate seeing the breadth of this team that came, was willing to come uh, and spend this evening with us. That's, uh, that's important, I think, the, the respect that that shows. Uh, uh, things that caught my attention, I know that uh, you've done Habitat for Humanity things. We just finished a Habitat for Humanity project mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the Dunstan area, the turn area, and that, uh, again, we're, uh, our community is very committed to creating a more affordable housing. It's one of the principal goals that We've uh, 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 repeatedly, year over year now, uh, uh, asserted. Uh, uh, and so that, that's just something to bring to your attention. Uh, I was wondering if Jay Chase's memo had been shared with you, the uh, uh, staff report. I hope yes. I sent that yes. out. Yes. So, so, yes. You, so you were able to see the initial yes. comments. Good, good. Uh, I thought it was a good start with the rear parking. Uh, that uh, the, the way the site plan sort of wraps that around uh, and blocks it substantially from uh, uh, I guess uh, that uh, that was well done. Uh, I think we're interested in uh, the the visual appearance as you come off the highway. You are entering Scarborough, uh, and so that. That is going to be, I think, very important uh, in this. Probably the minimization of, of parking, uh, maybe using more of, because you, you're selling cars. We appreciate that. <coughs> so, and we've, we've seen s sites where the landscaping <coughs> is really superior and they're displaying 
some of the models that they want to bring to the public's attention. So there may be ways in which to minimize the, the parking and the display of cars in, in a way that would uh, be satisfactory to us. Uh, I thought breaking up the scale of the building was mm -hmm. very important, and I thought that was well done. Uh, you have a neighbor, uh, Scarborough Downs, and it's probably the number one issue of interest to the uh, community uh, beyond, I think, maybe affordable housing and the fact that Scarborough really prides itself on, on wh where it is. It's on the ocean. It has the largest marshes uh, in, in the entire region. Uh, and so ecologically, we, we consider that a, a real touchstone issue for us. But uh, uh, Scarborough Downs is going to be the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of development. And you are a neighbor. You will be a neighbor. And so being in touch with them and understanding we, connectivity is an important issue for us out of Scarborough Downs. Trail, uh, trail connections. So uh, might not be roadways, but, uh, but those are some of the things that came to mind. So. Good. So we do. I don't know that we we may already have touched on on uh, on this in our previous comments, but the next uh, next uh, item is comments from planning board members on land use implications of the proposed contract zoning amendment. So. Yeah, <clears throat> my my biggest concern is is as I've mentioned before is is the um, and it's. Changing, it's changing land use in that it's going from a wooded area and a wetland to an impervious um, cover or strictly impervious cover. I think we need to think about, <clears throat> uh, I, I understand you're going to be paying some pretty hefty Army Corps fees to fill in these wetlands or if you, I, I would like to see you do some wetland mitigation. And if you can't do wetland mitigation, and uh, what's what's the Jim? Do you know off the top of your head what the well, numbers the, are? The trigger mechanism just happens to be fifteen thousand. Once you go over fifteen thousand, you get into compensation. Is that what you're thinking yes. of? Yes. And what's you, the what's the it, ratio? Uh, is it eight to one? It depends. It, it's right. negotiated with the Army right. Corps and the DEP. It could be right. anywhere from four to one to eight to one. To, I've seen. So have you done your seven. wetland inventory yet? We have done a wetland inventory. Uh, we're going to go back this spring and just to verify vernal pools, those okay. kind of things. Uh, as you know, those okay. can be very detrimental to development as well. Something of this size, we may want to do a peer review to because you are right at that 15,000 square feet. And again, we're very early in the process, just so we're all clear. Uh, this right is our on. first take. We've right heard on. some comments. We'll, we'll go back and we want to address some of your concerns. Absolutely. And one, just one question. I mean, I know Adam's not here this night, but he's very large on sustainability. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about using different products for surfaces to look at infiltration, uh, to look at filtration, yep. uh, porous pavement, these types of applications mm -hmm. in certain areas. Papers but they're still not going to mitigate no, the they're flood not mitigate, potential. Again, that's, you know, that's you're very right. aware that we will yeah. be going through the site location process through the town. DEP will be going through, and I appreciate you giving us a heads up to inform mm -hmm. town engineers to be present. Uh, we'll do that as well. Um, but there's a long ways to go before we get to this final thing, even through you and the DEP. And, uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that we're very close to some sensitive wetlands and some streams. We, we want to do our part as well. We've already discussed internally about putting a lot of this land in buffers, um, whether that'll be a conservation buffer, that's a deeper discussion I have to have with the owner. Uh, we're also going to discuss with the owner about potentially, as to uh, Mr. Donovan's comment, about linking some trails together and possibly looking at how that would work with the Crossroads project in the future. Uh, that corner that we abut to Crossroads has a lot of wetlands in it, but there are some narrow bands in there that may be <coughs> suitable for some kind of cross-country, you know, walking trails or something like that. I think that would blend into what Patriot Super is about as far as health and sustainability with their own employees, giving them a location to equally have exercise <coughs> and access to nature. So something that keeps coming up in front of the board, the planning board, is infringement on these wetlands and the flooding issues that it causes once you reach a critical mass. And what I'm trying to convey to you, Jim, is that 
we're approaching a critical mass at this intersection mm -hmm. because there's already some flooding that's happening. And I, I hear you loud and clear on that. I just want to be careful that we understand that we're on the downstream side of this. And, and I, I hear you loud and clear because it just gets passed on down to Route yeah. 1 and so on and so forth. We're very cognizant of that. It's, it's all part of, part of the same ecosystem. It is. It's and all we're part very of the same hydrologic we're be, unit. You know, we'll be treating Absolutely. as well as flood control. Those are the two standards we'll have with the DEP mm -hmm. and with the town. We're very cognizant of that. We're, we're going to work, work diligently with both those groups to make sure that we come to acceptable terms. So what I'd like what I'd like to sort of put on the table is just that we're just because you may not hit a DEP threshold or an Army Corps threshold doesn't mean we can't ask for off-site mitigation as an off-site improvement of some kind. And we want to get to just, and I get that going through the trails folks and things like that is a really, is really important and using buffers, but all of those things don't add up to the flood attenuation that we're going to need here. Okay, that's a lot of hydraulic capacity that we're losing. Mm -hmm. Until we, and I, I don't know the answer to that because obviously we haven't done these studies yet. Agreed. But when we get to that point, I mean, we can also look to see what the town may have for capital improvement projects in the vicinity, and, and you know, we can work with that. Read my mind. <laughs> to see, to see my what mind. Water, I think we have see, something in there. Yeah, to yeah. see what you know, what <laughs> projects you may have that, you know, what projects you may have that down yeah. the future, down the watershed <laughs> line that may need, you know, some help. So the other thing I'm thinking too is, um, and you, you sort of allude to it in your benefit impact analysis is um, there's a large outstanding public works assessment in full of over $200,000 that will be settled using the proceeds of the sale. So um, is that a sewer assessment? Yes, I believe that okay, is. Okay, so it's not a public works assessment. Maybe Rick, you are, but okay. I'm, I'm not. And yes, yeah, sewer assessment. Okay, sewer assessment. Because one thing that we're really having a problem with in Payne Road too is lack of public sewer. Um, especially in housing developments that are down the way. So maybe that's a really good use of, you know, helping out our public benefit. The assessment that if you pay, Tom can elaborate, but was imposed upon all the properties on Highgate Parkway years Understood. ago to pay for the sewer yep. that's there now. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got bills to pay now for that yeah. money, so that it's spoken for. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, it's, but it's going to the same place. It's going to the sewer, which we need sewer help down in that area there, too. So that's good. That's a good thing. Thank you. Thanks. Anything else? Susan? I'm going to end my comments on a positive note. Um, I'm really sitting here thinking it's, some, it's so synchronistic that we're talking about something this big with people who are actually listening to us. At the same time that we're doing something that big, Scarborough Downs, Crossroads, with people that we know and really trust. So you take two groups that really like Scarborough and have a big investment, and you put them together, and the chances of this being really, really special exists. And that feels really good. So congratulations, and look forward to hearing more. Thanks. And on that note, I'll hand it back to uh, Chairman Donovan. Good. Uh, I think uh, uh, process-wise, uh, uh, I'm going to ask Tom to explain where our discussion should end up sure. in terms of uh, our choices. Yeah, Corey gave a great overview of kind of this step one or phase one, I'm not sure what you call it. Um, I do want to just make kind of a procedural or housekeeping point. I've tried to keep copious notes here of all the input received. Um, as Rick said, he's drafted the framework of the contract zone. Uh, I'm certainly not an attorney. I, I tend to play one on every other Wednesday night, it seems, <laughs> on occasion. But the structure and format looks to be in keeping with our other ones, so I, I have no <clears throat> doubt in that regard. But there is an opportunity for us to insert additional um, provisions. And uh, perhaps some of what came up this evening will make its way into this document. We do have time to kind of work through some of those things. Uh, the timeline that was, um, or, or the process that was laid out is probably a two to three month timeline in actuality. Um, so it's very helpful to get that kind of input tonight. And Jay and myself and Councilor Donovan perhaps and others may be involved in those discussions in between. Uh, so I encourage 
planning board members and council members, if other things come to mind, certainly reach out to member staff so we're aware of that. And the council does have uh, really very broad discretion in this regard. Um, the public interest, the public benefit is, a, is the cornerstone of, uh, of your approval, if you will. And getting comfortable that you've met those necessary requirements is the council's judgment, basically. Um, there's some very encouraging words tonight. It sounds like I think we can find a way to get there. Uh, there'll be some further discussion. I would just simply note that a number of the things that came up tonight uh, may not be eligible for inclusion here. Uh, the sorts of things, the public benefit needs to bear some basic resemblance to the project and the impact of the project. And so I might be so bold to suggest that housing isn't a good fit, but I think there's a whole bunch of other stuff that um, may work very nicely. So I just want to kind of manage everyone's expectations in that regard. Uh, where we go from this evening, uh, it does require the council to take a vote as to how to handle what to do with the matter next. And this is slightly different than what was in your meeting packet. Essentially, you have three options. Uh, this would have to be moved uh, by the council. Um, those three options are to uh, have the applicant withdraw the request, and you don't want to consider it further. Or two, to continue through the process um, to request a contract zone with or without modifications. And again, don't get hung up on articulating what those modifications are tonight. Or three, revise and submit again. So uh, those are kind of the three options available to you tonight, and we need council action. The way the packet uh, presented, it wasn't particularly clear, so I asked Tom to uh, make it clear by this insertion of choose one of the following options. <laughs> There's three different ways to go. Uh, uh, one is withdrawal. Uh, three is re revise and resubmit start over and two is to continue the process forward and let's see where we get to uh, I think uh, before we get to a vote let's uh, uh, I, I ask everyone to kind of think about you know some thoughts on what is important to you so that uh, we kind of put out on the table we have these gentlemen here and so uh, let's go around and uh, check in with each one Sean why do you start Okay. You good? Jean Marie. Um, I'm fine. Uh, I can see going with number two. Yeah. Will. Yeah, I think uh, I think this was a very fruitful discussion. I appreciate the uh, attention, and I, I I don't have anything further to add, um, and I don't have any reservation with continuing this as we have. Um, I, I think what they've all been said before, but just to kind of restate, so again, the environmental impact. I do drive by this corner almost every single day, so I want it to be very pretty. Um, so the landscaping and um, and the, the public benefit piece, I think it is doing a contract zone, as you've heard loud and clear, I think tonight, is kind of a big deal. It's a special deal, and, uh, and there should be some benefit back to the public for that, what exactly that is, and, and to Tom's point, what what, is, what mat mirrors and matches best with this particular project. I'm not 100% sure, certain tonight, but uh, I have no problem sending this to the planning board and kicking it along the, the process road. I think we've, we've heard from a number of people <clears throat> ideas that they uh, think are important for you to either know or to consider as being uh, things that would represent public benefit. Uh, we will engage in an honest discussion with you uh, uh, and uh, would welcome ideas and suggestions because you yourselves have a long history of public contribution. So uh, we're, some of these things may be in the contract zone, some of them may not. But they just may be things that you say, this is who we are and this is what we want to do. Uh, and I think that will, that will help us to understand uh, what, we're, what we're partnering with. So uh, I'll accept the motion. And Mr. Chairman, before you vote, could I just say, I um, appreciate everything you said. And on behalf of the applicant, I would say we, we understand that the draft agreement is going to go to town attorney for review. The council and the planning board may, from tonight, come up with a number of conditions, restrictions, what have you, that you want built into the agreement. 
and we fully expect that and we appreciate that tonight's vote isn't uh, a complete sign off on what has been presented in terms of by draft but a starting point very good uh, it is it's it the is beginning a of a discussion that we'll have uh, hopefully we'll end up being very positive for both uh, Patriot Acura and for the town of Scarborough. Jean Marie. One motion. Please. Um, I move approval pursuant to Chapter 405, Section 4, Procedures A, Sub 3. Advise the applicant to continue to process the request for contract zoning with or without modifications suggested by the council. Second. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very much. Good Thank start. Thank you. Thank you, planning board. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. hearing your comments. Thanks for waiting outside. Thanks for including us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the last stop. Sort of yeah. Over. Sure it does. And then it. Uh, Got a little there, but it should be an interesting ride over. Thank you. 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 Yeah, yeah. I saw you a big gun. I I I I I I I I I I I Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Oh, you to get moving. We have to get moving. I'm moving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, I think we're back uh, in session. Uh, order number 17-109, uh, 7 p.m. public hearing on the request for the Scarborough Town Council to order the discontinuance for all portions of Avenue 2, located southerly of King Street with no damages awarded to the abutting landowners, and to file said order with the town clerk. Uh, we are going to start by, because this has been an attenuated matter. Uh, we're going to ask Attorney McCall uh, to provide us with a summary of what's before us so that people can appreciate, uh, if you're at home watching uh, uh, or in the audience. And uh, after that, we will have public comment. So, Attorney McCall. Good evening, members of the council. Um, as, as the chairman, um, as the chairman mentioned, the purpose of, of me being here tonight is to give a bit of background. Um, it was brought up at the last public hearing two weeks ago um, that there are members of the public who perhaps were less familiar with um, what's being discussed, the circumstances that surround it, and so I'm hoping briefly um, to give a little bit of context um, to date back a couple of years. Um, to you know, give direct answers to a, a couple of concerns that were raised by members of the public at the last public hearing, and then of course um, answer any other concerns or questions, um, if appropriate, by the members of the public who may speak tonight. Um, I checked in in the file, um, and the first correspondence that we have uh, for this matter dates back to April of 2014. Uh, so it's been quite some time. Um, in particular, uh, this particular process started uh, probably around January of 2016. Uh, 
which is the point where Mr. Gendron um, proposed uh, to the town the possibility of discontinuing this portion of Avenue 2 uh, in exchange for granting an easement for a pedestrian path along um, roughly the same route that exists today. Uh, it was at that point that our office, Bergen and Parkinson, uh, was retained uh, to look into the issue further. Uh, and in about April of 2016, uh, Mr. Bannon, on behalf of Mr. Gendron, uh, submitted quite a lengthy and, and well-researched letter that laid out the legal basis uh, for, uh, for part of Mr. Gendron's argument. And the basis of that argument, essentially, was that uh, based on, on their research and analysis, uh, that the town of Scarborough, in fact, uh, did not own and did not have um, any easement rights over Avenue 2. Um, and based on that, it, Mr. Mr. Gender proposed um, that the granting of these two pedestrian easements or a pedestrian easement at that point to the town was certainly in the town's uh, benefit. It was at that point where we uh, did our own research and analysis. Uh, we did title research. We did legal research and analysis. Uh, and we wrote a letter to the council, um, I believe dated uh, December 21st of 2016, uh, that came to roughly the same conclusion that uh, M uh, Attorney Bannon on behalf of Mr. Gendron had. Um, we had a couple of disagreements, uh, minor disagreements, but uh, our general conclusion w was that the status of the town's uh, ownership or any other rights of Avenue 2 uh, was attenuated at best. And because of that, it, it certainly was in the town's best interest um, to at least uh, move forward with looking at this proposed plan uh, as a way to maintain permanent public access to Pine Point Beach over Avenue 2. And so that's been the process that we've been in um, roughly for the past uh, two years. Uh, it started off, I believe a member of the public at the last public hearing uh, was slightly confused because uh, initially it was just Mr. Gendron and just uh, Mr. Gendron's side of Avenue 2 that was proposed to be discontinued. Um, we had reached out uh, to the leadership of the Gables uh, by the Sea Condominium Association. They initially had not expressed any interest in being involved um, in these discussions. Later on, um, they came to a, a different conclusion, and from a legal standpoint, it certainly is uh, more in line with what commonly happens uh, to discontinue uh, of the full width of, of a public right-of-way. Uh, rather than splitting it literally down the center and only discontinuing half of it. And so that's the process, uh, and I wanted uh, to then focus a little bit on, on the two documents, uh, the two principal documents that we've been reviewing for quite some time. I want to stress at the beginning that in developing these documents and in negotiating them, uh, the town has really had two principal goals. Uh, the first is to ensure that public access to Pine Point Beach over this path is preserved in perpetuity. Um, and the second <coughs> is, to the greatest extent possible, to ensure that um, the layout, the landscaping, uh, the general feel of that path remains as unchanged as possible. And Keith Smith, um, who's been working uh, for Mr. Gendron, has developed uh, quite um, a detailed landscape plan that is up on the projectors right now uh, just to give a little bit of feel. <coughs> First I want to give a couple of comments about easements generally. I know there have been some comments and concerns about uh, what an easement is, what it protects, uh, and how long it, uh, its duration is. Um, legally speaking, an easement is the right to use um, and to enter the land of another um, laid out in an easement deed document. Um, the term deed, I think, is important. Um, it is intended uh, to grant this right in perpetuity, um, and that would continue uh, following uh, the sale, the assignment, um, the transfer of that land by either of those landowners. Um, as I said, that right, is, the right of that easement is permanent. Um, that is laid out explicitly in Maine easement law, but more in particular is laid out explicitly in um, the two documents themselves. Um, it's the stated intent of the grand tour, um, which in this case would be either the Gables or uh, Mr. Gendron, uh, that this easement right uh, remain permanent. Uh, there certainly are ways um, under easement law that easements can be terminated. Um, typically, those would exist in situations like uh, 
the, the subject of the easement, um, the path in this case, being destroyed. Uh, certainly if, um, if, if sea level rise uh, were to affect um, the permanent easement area, um, that would certainly affect the rights that existed. Uh, certainly based on the agreement of the two parties, that being either Mr. Gendron and, or the Gables in the town, um, those parties could mutually agree to terminate the easement. Uh, certainly there would be uh, many reasons why that uh, likely would never occur. Um, but particularly the issue of extinguishment was brought up, I know, on a, on a number of occasions, and I wanted to touch upon that briefly. Um, the main law court actually has touched and, and has, has looked at the issue of extinguishing easements uh, as recently as 2017, and they've made clear that there are only two situations where that really comes into play. And the first is um, if the benefited party, which in this case would be the town, um, abandons that easement. So uh, it's clear that the public's use of that easement as a path is no longer happening. Um, but that also has to be coupled with some sort of affirmative action by the town to declare once and for all we no longer want to use this path. Um, there are certainly, uh, that would have to be very clear. Uh, the removal of signage, um, some sort of official pronouncement from the town that um, those rights are no longer wanted. Um, the second would be something called adverse possession, which essentially would require um, a third party to start using the path in a way that is completely inconsistent with its current use as um, as a path, and that would have to occur for um, an uninterrupted period of at least 20 years. Um, so the bottom line with that is that uh, these two circumstances are, are quite unlikely to occur, um, if, if not relatively impossible to occur, but I wanted to touch upon them briefly. Um, as to the specifics of the easements, we've been over uh, these um, both in our negotiating sessions and in other public sessions of this council. Um, but for members of the public watching from home, potentially, I uh, want to briefly lay out what's going to occur if the council approves this uh, at its next meeting. Uh, currently, technically, Avenue 2 is a 50-foot wide right-of-way. Um, the public path portion um, of this easement, uh, the easement is split into two portions. The public path is roughly 10 feet in width. Um, you can see uh, on the plans in front of you that it meanders. Uh, it, I believe it's the intent of Mr. Gendron and his landscape architect, and it was certainly uh, the intent uh, and desire of members of the Pine Point Neighborhood Association who are involved in these discussions uh, that this path meander naturally uh, rather than being a stick straight path from King Street down to the beach. Um, that is the public portion. Uh, the easement documents are, are very consistent that the, this will uh, be open to the public, um, consistent with how uh, the town operates any of its other public parks um, uh, that's laid out in ordinance. Uh, technically it is a dawn to dusk, um, but that is again consistent uh, with what the town uh, enforces in other situations. Uh, the rest of the easement area lies outside the bounds of that public path and it's been termed in the documents as a public conservation easement. Uh, there are specific restrictions on the use of that land. Uh, for instance, uh, no structures are allowed to be placed there. Uh, as you can see, there's a very detailed uh, landscaping and planting plan. Uh, this will be incorporated in the documents um, and will likely be recorded with the easement also. So this is not um, simply for uh, you know, this is this is not guesswork here. Um, the parties will be uh, constrained to planting what's on this plan unless um, changes are approved uh, by the council. Uh, and finally, a couple of, of other details. Uh, there, was <coughs> there was concern raised about a fence. Um, the Gables uh, by the Sea Condominium Association currently does have a post and rail style fence uh, further back, uh, further towards their property. Uh, they've asked to be able to move that uh, to border the edge of this easement area um, and to place two small signs on it that say uh, sensitive dune area, which is really just to mark the fact that it is protecting sensitive dune area and to hopefully um, constrain the public from moving outside of the bounds of that. Um, finally, uh, there was agreement among the parties to place a sign at the beginning of the, uh, of the path on King Street that says public way to the beach. Uh, and uh, motorized vehicles um, are expressly prohibited. 
And so, again, uh, we've been through this process uh, for quite some time. I, I think it's been a, a wholly collaborative process at, um, involving the town, uh, both the Butters, members of the Pine Point Neighborhood Association, uh, and others. And I think, uh, generally, uh, you know, given the circumstances, uh, it, the plan as presented involving uh, these plans and both easements really does uh, achieve both goals that were stated at the beginning. Um, public access to Pine Point Beach it will be protected by these easements. Uh, that will be in perpetuity. Uh, and you know, on the whole, while um, the path will change slightly to provide uh, more adequate buffers uh, for both abutters, uh, I think on the whole, um, the professional way that it's been laid out uh, will we'll certainly keep uh, that path as consistent as possible. And so I will stop there. Um, I'm happy you. to answer any other questions. Questions by the board of Attorney McCall. Thank you. Uh, ask anyone from the public who would like to address uh, this issue, please approach the podium. Uh, good evening. My name is Larry Hartwell. I live at 9 Puritan Drive. I didn't come to speak on behalf of this. I came to speak about the accurate dealership. However, this has certainly been a long, drawn-out process. Um, I wish I could say something positive tonight, but I, I guess the only thing I can say positive is at least we still have access to the beach. Um, I think we, out of the, the spectrum of possibilities and how we could have handled this, I think we took the least appropriate way. Um, I know we had counselors that didn't want to spend any money in litigation on this right from the get-go um, to, uh, to, to uh, litigate this. We could have fought it. Uh, we may not have been right as far as the law is concerned, but being right or being wrong isn't necessarily the way the final decision is made. If you're the, the town and I, I'm right and you're not, you've got the, the time and the resources to prevail in the end. <coughs> if I'm developing land, I want to do it in a hurry, you drag out the legal process for several years, I'll finally give up on it. I'll say it's no not worth it. The money. We could have made, I think, some sort of a variance for Mr. Jenner to build a house, a larger house on that property. We make variances all the time. We make contract zones changes. We could have done that and left the land as it is. He would have been happy. We would have continued to have our 50 foot right of way. Uh, we could have given him property of the 10 foots or whatever he needed and kept the rest. The Gables, when they first came to the meeting, their attorney said, we really have no interest in this one way or the other, but since you guys are discussing it, here we are. And so uh, initially they would, they didn't even, they had no interest in having half of the street. And I read somewhere where the, the land that's being given to the two abutters is being classified as wasteland. I do not know if that's correct. Uh, it certainly sounds as a lay person that that means it has no value even though it is beach, beach property. Um, so those are my thoughts this evening. And Thank if, you. If you don't think this is the best solution, then don't vote for it. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who would like to address the council on this issue? See no one. I'll close the public hearing. This is uh, a public hearing tonight. Uh, in two weeks, we have scheduled a second reading, uh, at which point I, uh, the matter will again be subject to public input. Uh, so, uh, if you're out there in the uh, audience or watching on television, uh, we will have one more opportunity for public input. Oh, business. Order number 18-001, second reading on the proposed amendments to the Higgins Beach character-based uh, zoning district. Uh, this matter is uh, uh, the question of uh, having the damage, uh, the, the rebuilding opportunity after damage has been incurred to match 
the rest of the community, the rest of the town. Uh, uh, right now, uh, the uh, rule uh, for the Higgins Beach Character Code is a has its own unique rule, and it was determined that it should comport with exactly what the rest of the town uh, is subject to. So that is the background of this uh, item. Uh, anyone wishing to provide public input, uh, please approach the podium. None will close. I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. <clears throat> I think this is pretty well understood by everyone, and uh, uh, it's a pretty straightforward matter, actually. So. Uh, I, th I think the only thing I want to put up was we had a really thoughtful uh, uh, public comment um, at, mm -hmm. the, at the public hearing um, regarding um, the, uh, the change in use uh, from of the um, four commercial properties. Um, I think that um, that while while I don't think there's anything in here that addresses the. Um, that is the next item up. Am I confused by this? Yeah, this one is. So this is their joint, though, right? They, they're, <laughs> we will deal with them separately, but this one just deals with the uh, if your property is damaged, ah. your right to rebuild. My apologies. Not a problem. I'm not, 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 my not a problem. <laughs> Other comments on this? <laughs> See, none. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, order number. <clears throat> 18-003, second reading on the proposed amendments to, no, no, no uh, order 18-002, second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough zoning map. Uh, this is a rezoning of that section of Ocean Avenue uh, that uh, was under the Scarborough uh, Higgins Beach Character Code and it had historically been an R4 zone. It was built out as an R4 zone and in compliance. And so by bringing it into the Higgins Beach Character Code, we were actually creating non-compliances. Uh, the planning department did an extensive uh, outreach to the owners of those homes to make sure that there was support for this change, uh, and it was unanimous support. So that's the backdrop for uh, for this one. Members of the public wishing to speak to this issue, please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Katie. Um, question. So the um, Higgins Beach Market lies in this in this zone. Yes. And has recently changed hands. Yes. And I'm just making the assumption that the new owners are aware of what's happening? Uh, the, for them, the nothing changes <laughs> no. because they they remain in the uh, Higgins Beach Character Code zone. Okay. So, so, so they, they, so I just, you know, given the timing of the sale, I just wanted to make sure, and I, and I get it, it's on them to do their due diligence and understand and know all of those pieces, but I want to just make sure that it's not one of those situations where after the fact. No, thank you for raising that, because the uh, sold sign just went up on the realtor's uh, advertisement for sale, uh, and I was thinking about it, and it's apropos of Council Rowan's comment that, uh, uh, if we were to change, and this was what was proposed by speakers, by a speaker, uh, to remove the Higgins Beach market from the zone, we would put it back into a non-conforming status, uh, which would, with new owners, would be a, uh, even with old owners, it would be a prejudicial thing to do, but with new owners who would be quite surprised by that development. So uh, that's, uh, uh, and, and there was uh, 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 statements by people. The background of that was that Dan Bacon worked with the person who had that concern and with the abutter, uh, the breakers, uh, to try to find a way to reconcile the concerns that were raised and did find a way that I thought was appropriate, which required any change and the activities of those 
four properties that make up the commercial, mixed commercial zone, uh, uh, site plan review would have to occur. And therefore, the planning board would be able to protect abutters against adverse impacts. Uh, further comments? So my comment is just that it was very well presented, and I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to have that. Yeah. Uh, That's it. Public record. Uh, further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Second reading, uh, this is 18-003, second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 405, Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance Section Roman Numeral 7C, Residential Density and Affordable Housing Provision Subsection B, Affordable Housing in Lieu Fee. This section clarifies uh, that uh, the housing, uh, the affordable housing user fees cannot be used for obligatory housing or uh, 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 affordable housing obligations of someone proposing uh, a development. Anyone in the public wishing to speak to this issue, please go to the podium. Seeing no one, accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Well, so I just wanted to again explain the motivation here. We, we, given the uh, timing of the sale of the Crossroad District, um, this recently came to the notice of the Scarborough Housing Alliance that um, we had not excluded the use of in lieu fees to, to uh, pay for development that would meet the contractor's obligations inside the inclusionary zone. The Crossroad District is the only inclusionary zone in town and it requires 10% um, affordable housing. Um, uh, build out, and we wanted to make sure that um, that it was clear that the intent was not to use the um, affordable housing fund for that purpose. Good. That's a good clarification. Other comments? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. New business order 18 uh, 019. <clears throat> Act authorized the town manager to execute a temporary construction easement to uh, Thomas and Terry. Uh, uh, Hegerly <coughs> of 39 Ocean Avenue to allow access during the construction of a new home on their property via town owned land. Identified as map 0U002, lot 4 on Scarborough's tax assessor's map, subject to the conditions that such access is limited to that portion of the town owned land on the ocean side of the existing stockade fence and that the area be restored to the pre-construction condition, and I'll ask the town manager to introduce this. Yes, uh, this is a property located immediately adjacent to the Higgins Beach parking lot. Uh, if you can picture the lot, there's a new bathhouse, there's a smaller lot uh, that is actually leased to the owners of uh, the Higgins Beach Inn. They have employee parking there. Uh, when we reconstructed that lot, uh, we uh, placed the, the existing stockade fence some distance back from the existing property. Uh, that immediate property, this one in question, uh, one of its corners and most of the home is literally on the property line. And so from a practical point of view, for them to even do basic maintenance to walk past their house, uh, they need some accommodation. So uh, being neighborly, we chose to relocate that fence to accommodate some very small access along the, the edge. I believe it's about a five foot offset. Uh, the new owners of that property are looking to uh, reconstruct the cottage, and so as part of the construction, they'll need access to this area just for practical purposes. Uh, they initially, and I think would still like to actually purchase that strip, I discourage that. Um, just from personal experience, selling town land, particularly in beach areas, can be challenging. Um, so I dissuaded from them from that, but certainly appreciated their dilemma, and I think this is a, a very fine workaround. It allows them to and their workers to uh, have use and access to this property, this area of the property uh, during construction, and the easement deed will, um, well, this, the temporary construction need easement will cease at the end of the construction. Good. Uh, any member of the public wishing to address the council on this issue, please approach the podium. If you not, I'll accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straight I think forward. the town manager explained it pretty well. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It's unanimous. 
Order 18-20, <clears throat> act on the request from the Scarborough Housing Alliance to award a grant from the Affordable Housing Initiative Fund in the amount of $100,000 toward the Avesta housing project to offset unexpected environmental remediation costs and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents related to this order. Uh, uh, I'll ask, uh, Will, do you want to give an explanation of the background on this matter? Sure. Um, so, uh, as you know, uh, the Southgate um, property was sold to Avesta several years ago um, in order to develop um, affordable housing on, on the site. Um, in order to do so, it, it kind of served two purposes um, or goals of the, the town, which was preserve the historic building um, and provide some affordable housing. Um, it, um, um, it was given um, uh, tax credits uh, by the main housing, um, and uh, those tax credits were awarded at a time when um, the the um, the markets for which uh, the public markets that were that were buying those tax credits and, and changing them into monetary value um, had changed their expectations around a um, a corporate tax relief that that was expected when uh, President Trump was had come into office. Um, as a result, the value of those tax credits went down considerably, um, and it made this um, this project uh, much harder to much. Now they had a funding gap that they that they couldn't come up with. Um, they um, took out several loans, uh, several very large loans. Um, that was unusual for for a project like this, um, and they also cut their developer fee. Um, the they also took uh, were t at the same time they were taking their construction bids um, and uh, doing some uh, research. Uh, around that, and, and uh, the what they found was there was some there was really really there were going to be larger environmental mitigation uh, expenses than they had initially budgeted for. Um, so in addition to the the project um, being short, um, it was now going to also be more expensive. Um, and so they came to us at our last meeting several weeks ago um, to kind of explain their situation and um, ask for some assistance to the town. Um, they came to us as a last resort. Um, realistically, um, they um, they did not. Um, uh, Avesta is a mission-driven organization. Their their mission is to provide affordable housing in Southern Maine and New Hampshire, um, and they are committed to this project. They made very clear that um, Avesta is going to going to finish uh, building houses and meet the obligation, or building the affordable housing at Southgate and meet its obligation. However. Um, the, uh, the, the expediency with which they'd be able to do so could be in jeopardy. They're closing on their construction loan shortly. Um, and um, they're also a uh, terrific partner for, for the town if, as we have our goal of, of building uh, more affordable housing in town. They're somebody we probably wanna work with in the future. Um, and so kind of meeting them in, in the middle and providing additional support um, uh, was deemed by that committee to be uh, very important. And so they're, they're putting forward uh, the concept here of using $100,000 um, from the affordable housing uh, trust fund uh, in order to help um, the uh, Avesta close its funding gap, or excuse me, the expense gap of the overruns of the, uh, of the uh, environmental impacts. Um, and really what it was is when they were doing the um, assessment of the soil, they found more lead in the soil and they had to take away just huge truckloads of um, lead infused mm -hmm. soil, um, which is expensive because they have to cover it and truck it away. Um, and uh, that's that's what we would be offsetting. Thank you. And that uh, the Scarborough Housing Alliance uh, uh, received all that information and has made a recommendation to support this order. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, the, the chair of the committee um, did, was not able to attend tonight because of the snow, um, but she had submitted a letter that's in your packet uh, explaining that, um, that that was the recommendation of the committee um, and the, the current balance in the, <coughs> in the fund. Thank you. Uh, members of the public wishing to speak to this as you approach the podium? Seeing no one uh, accept the motion. So moved. 
second uh, discussion. A good explanation by Will as to the justification of this. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, there are no non-action items. Standing special committee reports and liaison reports, uh, <clears throat> mindful of the snowy conditions. I'll start with Jean Marie. Um, I don't have anything on the same long range planning. Is it 8 a.m. Friday? Talking about crossroads development. <coughs> Sector board is next week. Communications. Maybe tomorrow. I am planning to have tomorrow, barring any unforeseen circumstances, uh, at, at uh, 5.30 here at Town Hall. Uh, and or the, unforeseen sort of well, like you <laughs> shut down town hall or something, <laughs> ordinance committee, no ordinance doubt. committee at uh, four thirty next week. <laughs> so don't go anywhere, Will. We'll <laughs> next week, <laughs> uh, yes. Pretty sure I'm sick that day. Thursday. <laughs> Council of Uh The only committee that met since our last meeting for me was the Eastern Trail Alliance, and uh, their biggest piece coming up. It's quite exciting. We have a fundraising gala <laughs> happening on April 7th. Um, it's going to be held at Camp Ketchup. The time pilots are playing. It's a $50 ticket. Um, there'll be uh, beverages uh, and dancing and auction items. And I'm really excited to share that we have a, at least one of the auction items um, is one that I got to experience firsthand. Uh, last summer, and that is a day out on the water with Bill Green and uh, Denny Denham. And let me tell you, those guys are a wealth <laughs> of knowledge and a lot of fun. Um, and the fishing expedition, it's a day-long fishing expedition. It includes dinner for, or lunch for two out on Great Diamond Island. And um, you can learn a lot from Bill Green and Denny. They're good guys. So well worth coming to attend and putting in a bid on that particular item as well as some other great auction items. Thank so. you. Councilor Rowan. Um, so the uh, 4,000 <coughs> Scarborough Housing Alliance met. A uh, large part of the discussion was around um, Avesta. We also had um, uh, Rock Rivers Bear came in to talk about Carrier Woods, mm -hmm. um, which is the development up on uh, Muzzy Road, um, where they they are have taken a density bonus uh, and are obligated to put um, uh, have four affordable units. Um, and they were just questioning. Our ordinance is a little bit unclear about um, uh, how much he's actually able to rent to out for. And so he was asking for clarification. We are probably going to need an ordinance uh, change, and that committee will have another recommendation for the ordinance committee coming up. So um, there's definitely some two conflicting clauses in there, and we need to we should clean it up. Um, uh, but he's going to move, move ahead on the expectations that, that will happen. Uh, we also had historic preservation. Um, met last night um, and uh, the main thrust of the, or we discussed a number of a number of topics um, one of the most interesting ones was we'd really like to um, the one of the items that we've been talking about a lot recently is um, the Beechridge schoolhouse uh, which is a um, property up on Holmes Road that is in poor condition and we'd really like to start talking about what options we might have. Um, and so uh, we're going to be asking to get a stakeholder group together um, so that we can talk about our options. And we, it's somewhat timely because the, um, I think the trustee of the, the group that currently owns it, his business apparently is seasonal and picks up in April. So we want to try and get that in in the near term. So we'll be reaching out shortly. Councilor mm -hmm. Bebun. Um, the only item uh, to report is for appointments um, and would like to post the following. The Energy Committee, <clears throat> the chair, um, the chair of the Energy Committee is requesting that Michael Mitchell be removed from the committee due to lack of attendance, and to appoint Deborah McDonough as a full voting member to fill a term to expire in 2019. The chair of the um, Housing Alliance is also requesting that Tim Peters be removed from the committee due to a lack of attendance. Uh, for the Planning Board, um, the nomination is to move Susan Oglis from a full voting member to first alternate with a term to expire in 2019, and to move Rachel Hendrickson from a first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2019. Um, we did receive a resignation from Robert Willett from the Shellfish Conservation Commission, and um, we're recommending that Tim Downs um, be nominated um, as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020. And on the Zoning Board of Appeals is to move Ed Blay from a full voting member to first alternate with a term to expire in 2018 and to move Karen Shoup from first alternate to a full voting member 
with the term also to expire in 2018, and to, to appoint Melina, Melina Torrens as the second alternate with the term to expire in 2019. The reason for the removals is that um, pursuant to uh, the town's charter under section 204, the council has the right to remove um, members who do not participate um, I believe it says four consecutive meetings or it doesn't attend at least 75% of the meetings. So um, that's why those requests were being made. And then um, the moves from voting members to alternates and alternates to vote, that was actually at the request of those individuals. So that's something that they wanted to we wanted to accommodate for them uh, because of their schedules. And that's all I have. Good. Uh, uh, Metro Regional Coalition uh, uh, met last week. Uh, these are the seven towns that comprise regional Portland. We're working on uh, trying to understand what's going to happen in Augusta regarding marijuana. Uh, it remains a very uncertain picture, although the uh, committee, that joint committee that's been working on it, did report out a bill that was virtually unanimous. So there is a reasonable chance that some progress will be made. Uh, in those circumstances. It still looks like a, a year and a half away before they are predicting that licenses will be issued by the state, which would trigger <clears throat> uh, an, an uh, entitlement to receive a license from the municipality. And the municipalities appear, based on the current legisl uh, proposed legislation, to have to opt into accepting these. So we'd have to take some active initiative to uh, actually have retail sales, uh, uh, and that's primarily it is retail, uh, grow, uh, grow permits, retail sales permits, and testing permits. The, the proposed bill excludes clubs of any sort. So. Uh, good. Uh, town manager's report. Yes, in the interest of time, I'll simply uh, relate one matter. Um, in police report, <coughs> we've had very consistent activity in the public safety building. This is the, the sale of it. Uh, at least two showings every week since it's gone live on the market. Uh, and, but progress has really picked up considerably in the last week. And at this point, I have two offers uh, that are pending that uh, we're scrutinizing, and I expect a third tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think. Um, Based on the two in hand and what I'm hopeful for tomorrow, uh, we may have a deal sooner than later. So uh, this council authorized me to negotiate a full purchase and sale agreement, which includes a leaseback provision. That's <coughs> some of the nuanced negotiations going on. Uh, so I, I hope to deliver a complete purchase and sale agreement for your consideration <coughs> next meeting. Thank you. Uh, Councilor comments, Councilor Katerina. Um, I don't want to hold anyone up, but I just want to remind the public that with everything that's going on in Scarborough, that uh, it's important to keep in mind, to be mindful of your behavior towards one another, uh, keep an open mind, and um, be kind to one another. That's it. Councilor Foley. I echo uh, Councilor Katerina's feelings and remarks. Um, you know, we're all, it's hard to know all the situations uh, on both sides of this controversy. And uh, most importantly, though, we are friends, we're neighbors, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers. And that's going to be true uh, before and after this uh, is resolved. So stay mindful of that. Thanks for um, So drive carefully tonight. I also uh, received a text that uh, uh, school is uh, canceled tomorrow in Scarborough, so there you start um, I actually wanted to shout out to uh, David Jackson. Uh, David um, lives in Scarborough and he is the police chief, I'm sorry, the uh, fire department, uh, the chief of the fire department in Portland who is uh, retiring. Mm -hmm. um, David has um, done a lot for Scarborough as well as his wife Deborah, who I served on the school board. Uh, with many moons ago, so uh, you know, want to wish them luck as they get into that stage of their life, and congratulations. And I also wanted to, you know, you know, suggest that um, I think tempers need to be toned down, and we need to remind ourselves that we are neighbors and friends, and that we all try to do the best for this town. And so, I also want to, um, both professionally and personally, uh, give a, um, a shout out to Donna Beely, Carrie Lightford, and Jody Shea. I have an utmost amount of respect for them, um, for the work that they've done 
um, and the work that they will continue to do. So um, I hope that we all support them. Thank you. Uh, I, I share those feelings that we need to be a community, as we always have been, that avoids excessive reactions. There are appropriate things, and people do get fired up, but uh, being able to be the adults in the room uh, and exhibit behavior that we would want our children to model, that I think is critically important in these uh, inflammatory times. Um, I do want to shout out to Deb McDonough, who at the ECHO Excellence Awards this week at ECHO Maine was uh, given an ECHO Excellence Award, and no one could be more entitled to such an award than she. So good for her. Accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. We are adjourned. Call myself out. <clears throat> Well, yeah. 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 Ye